Hi, I'm Tom Scholey, co-writer and artist of Transformers vs. G.I. Joe and creator of American Barbarian, and you are listening to 11 O'Clock Comics. <laughs> Bullseye. You fighting Daredevil? Oh boy. Nailed it. Put that card down, Dev. No, I just saw Bullseye on the cover of the solicit to Loki number Loki. four. And I, and yeah. I thought, that's well, odd, but okay. Yeah, and it's not even one of their contest of champions. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure I'm a sure playing sure. card could hurt in a little god. That's cool, yeah. <laughs> what if it's, a, what if it's the Joker though? I think that would hurt him. <laughs> one of the <laughs> You're an asshole. You are such an, an asshole. One of the guys, now listen, one of the guys came into um, the shop and he was like, hey, Dave, what's up with this Jimmy Olsen series? Is this any good? And Dave's like, oh, it's really good. It, it delves into, and Dave is going into like the theoretical reasons why it's good because it analyzes the Olsen family and the members and it's so very well written and, and everything I agree with, right? And then once it quieted, it quieted down, I was over going through the dollar boxes, right? I said, is this your card? <laughs> Hysterics. People rolling around on the floor, let me tell you. Oh, God. And we hope we have you rolling around on the floor because this is 11 O'Clock Comics, episode 872. And I am Vince B. Yes, you are. Uh, I am a quenched David A. Price. Oh, nice. And yes, this this is not, in fact, Hollywood Shuffle. Yet, I am Robert Townsend. Ooh, Meteor Man. Yes, nice. but you're, you're not Robert Townsend. You're Jason Wood, everybody. And get this, the wayward son returns. Yes, mm. fresh and sparkly off his recent triumph, Local Man Gold. Yes. <laughs> it's our dude, our boo, our brother, Tony Fleece is back with us Hello, again. Hello, everyone. Happy to be back. I'm I'm not sticking my pinky in your butt. Local Man Gold was awesome. It really was. I I don't know that I, uh, yeah, I I wasn't on the show when you all talked about it. So, been meaning to send you. I might have texted you, but I thought it was awesome, dude. So, oh, thank you so much. Yes. And the uh, shop owner said, hey, tell your buddy Tony to make more foil covers because I guess (laughs) that issue sold much more than the other issues. Well, I don't know if I mentioned it when I was on, but, uh, that foil cost so much that we only broke even on that issue. So, <laughs> oh, oh gosh. shit! A million copies moved, and you only broke even. Like, what is that? Well, that's why he's going to recoup all that money with the uh, image homage covers for the next that's couple right. months. That's what we're really hoping for. Uh, that, by the good call, David. Uh, Local Man Number Six is about to go on FOC next week, uh, and we've got uh, a Walking Dead 20th anniversary cover, and we have an Image Comics homage cover. You guys should check out. Nice. Tell your shop you want those. Here's for, you, the, for you plebs, FOC means final order cutoff. It means the last chance that your store can get you that comic. That's right. They set nice. the order numbers based on what the shops order. And the last chance to tell the shops that you want one is on Monday. Uh, the foil costs a lot because we did it on the front and the back. And so they had to – the regular foil is fine. But if you do it where it wraps around like that, they had to put like a finish on it. That, so that the spine doesn't crack, and that is what is expensive. Ah, I love. So, did you talk. when you were deciding to do this, and you're like, "Well, let's do a foil cover, let's go all in," and then you get the price, and it's exorbitant. Are you guys just caught up in euphoria to the point where you're like, "Ah, fuck it"? Well, I mean, yes and no. I mean, we <clears throat> we'd already said we're doing a foil cover, so there was a <laughs> minute where we were like, we could just print the image of foil, you know, and just have it look like a like a picture of a foil cover, you know. But sure. we also thought like people would never forget how chintzy that was. And mm. you know, once once you betray somebody's trust like that, you you can't get them back. It's really true. Yes. So so we just uh, moving forward, we won't do two sided foil covers. Smart. We appreciate the aesthetics. Thank you. Yes. Well, like Dagwood Bumstead, I'm gonna uh, symbolically use your advertisement as cheese and layer another piece of cheese on top because I am talking who sponsors this show? 
Cheapgraphicnovels.com. That's right. Cheapgraphicnovels.com. If you're looking for Omnibu, collected editions, trade paperbacks, which are the same thing, only different words, oh. and manga, just head on over to cheapgraphicnovels.com. Check this out. Our buddy Jake Smith, the Blood Force Trauma collection out of Dark Horse is out. The retail price is $19.99. I hear you all laughing because you know you're not going to pay that. You can hop on over to CheapGraphicNowledge.com and get it for $13.99. And get this, uh, Tony's friend, Greg LaRoche, who did The Almighty. I talked Ed about it. <laughs> Why did I say Greg? I don't know. <laughs> Ed LaRoche. Who <sighs> did... <laughs> Who did the um, what? It's a good thing I was here. It was and is uh, the Almighty. I talked about it. It's a cool series. Trade paperbacks out $11.89. And if that wasn't enough, what else do we have here? So you could scroll on this thing for years and just find a whole mess of stuff that you want to bring home. Oh, Black Cloak, Volume 1, $10.49. Nice. Yep, yep. Uh, Plus, Max is also always having crazy sales. Nick and Dent sales, Omnibu sales, like crazy, crazy sales. Sometimes, if you're, it's a site you want to you want to hit up more than once a month because you might just catch it one day and there's some Wumba discount on a collected edition you really wanted but didn't have the budget for, and suddenly you're getting it for like twenty five dollar. It's true. Earth Divers, Volume One, Kill Columbus. Twelve dollars and fifty nine cents. Shit, it's that's thirty. Twice the price. Thirty percent off. This is what gets me now. Dark Horse is reprinting the creepy and the eerie archives in soft cover, so you can get volume two of the creepy archives, which you need if you don't have this stuff already, for seventeen dollars and forty nine cents. That's thirty percent off. You know where to go. Cheap graphic <coughs> novels. <laughs> <laughs> dot, dot com. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, it's a mess. It's a mess. Tony comes and just shits everything up. <laughs> oh my god, that's funny. Ah, uh, so what are you drinking, Vince? So you, you need something to drink. You are drinking something because because your throat is your throat is dry. It, it, no, I'm drinking cherry limeade. I didn't feel like oh. alcohol. This while wow, your boo your boo comes on, and that's how you Maybe do it. You should. I didn't do him anything. I huh. who <laughs> move? Take it away. <laughs> I ain't playing your game. Nope. <laughs> You're not, not falling into the Not trap. doing it. No, no, no. Well, I am, you know, I almost had a very big crisis here this week because wifey, wifey hurt her ankle. She's fine. She's going to be fine. But I had to run to some stores to pick up some things because uh, she couldn't. And I went to the BJ's, which for, yeah. I don't know if that's, a, I don't know if that's a national thing or it's well, like a Sam's Club or a Costco. It should yeah. be. It should yeah, be. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's where I get my, my G0, my Gatorade Zero, right? So I go over to the Gatorade Zero section to get a couple pallets, you know, two tree pallets, and there's no fucking Gatorade Zero. And I'm like, I'm apoplectic. Like I'm, I'm calling up Better Health to have a chat. Like I'm, I'm like, what? I can't, I can't not have the G Zero. So I collected, I collected myself. I thought, all right, well, I probably have another two, three days worth at home. Uh, hopefully, they're going to restock. I'll come back and see. Well, yesterday was D Day, and I rolled to the BJ's again. Walked all the way down because the, the, the Gatorade section is the very end of the of the gigantic store. Turned the corner and like a beacon of light, like the golden fleece. Just like that, Jason. This Jason found his golden fleece with three fresh opened pallets of Gatorade Zero. So in celebration of that, Vince, I am having fruit punch flavor G Zero. Nice. I thought you were going to say they were out of Grey Poupon or something, like really traumatic. Nah, nah. You don't like grape poupon? Uh, no, I prefer the, the the coarse ground mustard. Like, you know, that's that's really my jam. Dad <laughs> knows what I'm talking about. I do. Yeah. yeah I do. Okay. What are you drinking, Tony? Oh, I'm gonna have just because normally I come on here and bullshit you guys, and I got a little <laughs> bit of, I've got a little bit of good news today. So oh. I'm gonna have a Modelo Especial. What's the good news? <clears throat> so, you know, normally I come on here and I'm in like a a panic trying to get work done. I'll, I'm, I'm still going to work after we finish here, but I'm usually like trying to draw a comic in like 10 days or 15 days or something. 
And I got an email from Image today, and I was expecting our deadline for Local Man number seven was going to be like the 4th of October. And it's like the 16th of October. Oh, shit. You got all the time in the world. You got enough time to hop to New York Comic Con and hang out with us. <laughs> it's like, That's true. What weekend is that? The weekend before. The 12th. Yeah. Yeah, the weekend before. <laughs> well, I do think I'm busy then, but I would 10th, 11th, 12th or something. Hang out with you guys, of course. Ninth, ninth through the eleventh, through the twelfth. Ninth, yeah, tenth, eleventh, twelfth. Yep. Monday through Thursday. No, 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 no. Twelfth no. through the fifteenth. Oh the 12th yeah, you're Thursday. Right. You're right. Twelfth through the. Oh, so you'd have to be back that. So you'd have to leave either Saturday or early no, Sunday. No, because he could get it done on the eleventh. Still beat the deadline. Oh yes, yes, beat that. Oh right, right. I, I, I thought you had to be back. Right, the deadline's the sixteenth. My bad. Okay. Well, you know that is the only weekend in October I'm not doing anything. All right. Well, let's. You are now. Oh, <laughs> let's leave it open. <laughs> that would be the stupidest thing I ever did. <laughs> I'm gonna upgrade. Dude, my you st- could come hang out at Stately Wood Manor. It'd be lit. That would be. We're great. actually thinking about staying in the city one night. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. All right, we'll talk more about this for sure. Okay, okay. Anyway, what a blessing. Shout out to Trisha Ramos, who does the uh, deadlines at Image for giving me this beautiful 12-day gift. Uh, it's, a, it's been a wonderful second half of the afternoon. I literally woke up in a panic, you know, like completely tense and stressed, and then I just got this email to the, it was like, hey, you know, treat yourself. Have a nice afternoon. <laughs> now, wait, before Dap does his drink, you and Tim own local man Lock, Stock, and Barrel. Don't you set the deadline? Yes, but we've already solicited it, which means oh, got it. Okay. Cops know when it's coming out, and if it's not out on time, then it's returnable. And blah blah blah. blah. Gotcha, gotcha. Can't have that. Well, who would return that anyway? Well, exactly. No one. People, unethical people. I assume. Non-discerning comic book readers. That's who. Well, listen, we like their orders just the same. We like the ethical. <laughs> yeah. <and> discern- <laughs> <laughs> you suck. Thanks for your money. You like the speculators, the flippers. You're, all you're, you're, come on, come on. That's right. Nice. We're making something for everybody. <laughs> what did the Bardesian cook up tonight, Dad? Uh, actually, no, it's not the Bardesian. Oh. Uh, this is just a shout out to our boo, Caleb. Uh, for Christmas, he sent me uh, Rocktown, Arkansas, straight rye whiskey. This is a, a 92 proof. Um, but because it's rye and it, it, it is a little sharp, I don't uh, I don't drink it all that often. But tonight I decided to actually... Splash a little bit of, uh, maybe a little more than a little bit, but I splashed some ginger ale in there. It's on point. I'm I'm enjoying it quite a bit. Got the big ass cube in there, so a little rye, a little oh, ginger ale. The BAC. I'm all set. Nice. I got a couple thank yous, Vince, if I might, before we jump in. Hey, go maybe nuts. Uh, yeah, I was going to say one should be a group thank you. Well, I don't know. Tony probably wasn't included, although Tony knows everybody, so he's probably also got the same thank you just randomly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So the the group one, I believe, at least it should. I don't if it doesn't arrive. I know we're all getting it. Um, our longtime friend and supporter of the show, patron Mitchell, um, was kind enough to grab copies for each of us of uh, Death Transit Tanager, uh, number one, which is Carl Kershaw's new project. It's actually a web comic that you can read if you Google Death Transit Tanager or Carl Kershaw. You can read his web comic for free. Uh, online, but he is putting it in print, and this is the first issue. And Mitchell wanted us to read it, and knew that we didn't participate in the crowdfunding campaign, so he procured copies for us, and they are signed. And it, not only the nice copy, but they're actually signed by Carl, which is pretty neat. So yes. that thank you to that. Did, and did, then, uh, before you move on, did you yeah. happen to look inside that comic? Yeah, I read it. I read the whole thing. Yeah, I read it. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous. The art is a punch to the face. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's very powerful stuff. Like, I was like, Carl, what you eating, my man? Like, this is, Carl, Kershaw's good, but real good. But this is in a style that I don't think we've seen much from Carl in his style. I shockingly read the back matter as well, and he discussed his, he was inspired by all the anime that he's, he lived in Japan for a couple of years, and he was inspired by uh, anime and manga to, uh, he actually mentions the specific works that inspired him, um, uh, I'll have to go back and re-reference it, but yeah. So that that was the vibe he was going for. Yeah, incredibly attractive, kinetic, just gorgeous, amazing art. I can go yes. on and on, but people need to read this. It is just for sure. That, it's that good. Yeah. Yep. And then the other thank you, which I believe is a solo joint, uh, is from other longtime friend of the show and patron Davin Pasek. He sent me 
uh, Rosemary Valero O'Connell's Don't Go Without Me um, because we were, I think, chatting about uh, a couple of creators and he knew I was a fan of her work and also asked me if I had read this yet. And uh, yet it came out in 2020, but I said, no, I actually forgot to order it when it came out and I don't have it yet. So he sent me uh, a copy. I don't, I don't know if it's his copy or a, another copy, but he sent me a copy and I did read it. So uh, if we have time tonight, I will talk about it uh, henceforth. Davin sent me something as well. Nice. And me. Oh, yes. yes. Um, unlike you, I'm a big fan of, of Matt Kent, right? So uh, That's true. I, I, I got I to I gotta, I gotta be able to come up with that. Yeah. I'll clue you in. He, uh, he asked me if I had read Mr. Mammoth, the book that Kent did with Jean-Denis Pendo or Pendanks, yes. and I had not read it. And I'm really glad I did. So I don't know if you've read this, Jason. Mr. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So maybe if you're feeling, you know, like slumming, we could talk about it later in the episode. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was sent uh, a miniseries from Dark Horse. This is the trade collection. Uh, but when it was coming out, I was waiting. I was like, I'll I'll look for the trade, pick it up on, on from one of the shows we go to, or I'll just get my hands on it eventually. And so our boy slides into my DMs and asked me if I'd read this. And I had said no, because I love the creators on it, like Patton Oswalt and Scott Hepburn. My man sent me Minor Threats. And I know that... Oh, uh, nice. There's some... Uh, th- there's a spinoff going on right now. Uh, I think the alternative... Th- there's, yes. there's a book based on the world of Minor Threats. So yep. I'm going yep. to look into that when I finish this trade. But, I mean, we... We're fans of Scott Hepper. I, I know Jason and I are. I know that uh, it, yeah. it's I've got art. It, it's I got some of his uh, couple pages from when he drew the um, the uh, the Drax book mm-hmm. uh, that 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 uh, Phil Brooks wrote. But the uh, I, I I'm a big fan of Scott. Love his work, and and this looks not quite like what I would expect from Scott. Still looks great. Actually, just some pages here that remind me of like. Tom Fowler and spots, but there's, it's it's a great looking book, colors popping. Uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to checking out these characters because uh, I, I I dig the. Con- I'm I'm a big Pat Oswalt fan as well, so I'm just really excited to check this out. So uh, once I finish the couple of things that I'm in the pro- process of finishing, I'll I'll jump on this to uh, talk about it soon. Nice conceptual continuity. I actually uploaded some Scott Hepburn art to Calf yesterday. You did. Yep. Well, there we go. This is cool. Tony, let Tony, Tony give his thanks to uh, Davin and Mitchell. What, what they send him? <laughs> I, got, I, I don't have thanks so much as I just feel a little bit uh, left out here. Left out? <laughs> well, you, you, you are the official fourth. You know what I think it you're, is? You're chair 4A. They probably just didn't have my uh, right. address. Right, right, right. Totally. Although I feel like everyone in comics has your address. That's true. <laughs> well, I've moved. It's probably at my old place. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't foreclose yet on you? Oh. <laughs> Every day we get closer and closer. What? But is, is it <laughs> too soon? Too soon? <laughs> to drag me out of here to debtor's jail. There's still debtor's jail. Oh, yeah. Jason, uh, is, let it, us know. is it beat up everybody week? Did I not get the memo? It it's a roast, great. Vince. Okay. Yeah, we could take it. Yeah, we well, we definitely can. You got yeah. thick skin. I have yeah. incredibly thick you're skin. You're so mean to Jason. You're you're so sensitive today. I'm I'm mean to Jason. On you the regular, every time that, I come on here, yeah, Tony always brings that up. Dude, I'm Sicilian. Mm-hmm. That's how we show love. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I'm right. reciprocating. Um, this is going to be really really fast. I just want to okay. get the get the ball rolling by saying, um, book of the year came out today. Holy shite. Oh, yep. Okay. Yeah, it was a really it was a terrible week and I was looking something for something to lift my spirits, uh, albeit momentarily. And what do you know? We get a book today completely written and drawn. Yep. By Frank Miller. Yep. Mm. Oh Christ. And not a symbiote. <laughs> it, it is well, not a symbiote to be found. Ronin, book two, number four, created, written, and drawn by who? Frank Miller. And uh, inked and toned by Daniel Henricks. Um, I just, it, it's, it's awesome. It's Frank, and he's drawn everything. And it looks really good. Um, 
it, it echoes of the well there if you listen very intently you can hear a faint faint echo of the original ronin like it's there buried somewhere but i i just loved it it's frank drawing like what's not to love uh uh don't ask me what what transpired um <laughs> uh-huh. yeah so uh i mean the uh i guess aquarius has a baby and uh it's it's very Dragon Ball Z ish. Um, it's it's just awesome to look at. So great job, Frank. Still got it, my man. <laughs> it, this thing super moves. I haven't read it yet either because it is as you as you hinted at. It is a little bit tough to tough to parse. Yes, but, yeah, uh, it I mean, it is. Um, but as far as action goes, like he he's definitely like his. His detail is dialed down about a million degrees, but the fundamentals are still there. I have so much fun looking at it because it's just like this motherfucker can can just tell a story that moves like as if he's just breathing or talking. You know. Yes, it is. A, a, it's a tad bit repetitive in some spots. Yeah, but that's okay. Um, he, yeah, it's um, you know, if I put this side by side with a book that came out last week by a very uh, well. Uh, loved artist i would say that this is the much better book in terms of story um yeah so i'm just that's that's an illusion you can figure that out on your own what's that what book yeah what are you talking about uh gargoyle of gotham oh Raphael grandpa yeah it looks great it's the 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 writing is terrible you know yeah I haven't read it yet either. Yes, it's, no, it's facts. It's it, is, it, is, it is a stone cold stunner of a book, and the dialogue is nonsensical. It's like looking to the looking into the eyes of God when you look at the art. The art is just phenomenal. Yeah. Um, every nuance, every line is just brilliant, and then the words drag it all down to the the the, the you know the deepest level of of Hades. Yeah. Here's what I don't get. Here's what I don't get about Grandpa. Right, he's Brazilian. Now Brazil is is one of the largest economies in the country. It it is you know that is not a particularly cheap place to live. As some of our listeners may think, oh, it's cheap to live in. It's not cheap to live in Brazil, uh, unless you're living in like a favela. And I doubt he's living in a favela. Um, so I love Grampa. You know that. Now to be fair, Grampa on the very rare occasions he's done commissions or he has pages to sell, they sell for crazy money. So I'm sure that helps. But I I look at him and I think, how does dude pay his mortgage? Because I do not, I, I've never heard of him having another job. Now he made that doesn't mean he doesn't have one. But like, dude makes one comic every three, four years. Over and here, maybe he's got stuff going on over there. I don't think so. I'm always, I'm, I mean, I'm always on the lookout. Huh. I mean, given what seemingly poor writing he has, I'd just as soon read a Brazilian version of his comics, right? I mean, yeah. I, um, yeah, yeah I, I, it must just be the art because I know that the dark, the dark night golden child pages were thirty five thousand a page. So I guess that carries along. <laughs> I guess that I guess that goes a long way. So for okay. real, yeah, that's almost like Tony Fleece level. <laughs> that's almost stray dogs money. <laughs> that is crazy, yeah. but yeah, um, thanks, Frank. I, I, it's it's a wonderful book uh, to look at. Maybe those royalties from uh, Mesmo Delivery are still just rolling in. Yeah, freaking Vander today asked us on our Slack that we have a little Slack like, "Hey, what do you guys think of Valentino's Batman?" I'm like, for real. I'm like, oh, no, Silvestri, Silvestri. I mean, Silvestri, not Silvestri. It's Valentine. Silvestri's, I'm like, come on, dog. I'm like, come on. <laughs> well, he's got a hard on for Silvestri. We knew that. No, I know. But, but still, I, I mean, I, we're not going to lie to him. the last time Silvestri but... wrote something that was worth reading? Mm-hmm. Um, weak, weak. What's that? I'm not talking about that. I just, I love to look at that book. It's beautiful looking. Yeah, it definitely is. Yep. yep. Oh, the Batman book he did? It is weird that, like, remember for a while Jeff Loeb was, like, the guy who could write a coherent story and would and would be there for all those guys that, like, you know, who were just a badass. And it seems like they sort of got Jeff Loeb out of the game. Like, the Jim Lee doesn't need a Jeff Loeb to, to write Hush anymore. They'll just, they'll just, Mark Silvestri will do his Hush and just do the whole thing. Yeah. And it almost... Well, it's it, like, like, didn't I, Jeff Loeb, quite, like, quasi get canceled, right? Like, there was that little, like... Really? Yeah, not like major. He was like one of the soft. I thought he was like one of the soft canceled guys. Yeah. Huh. But I don't think that's why. I mean, oh. Silvestri's not going to work with somebody because of 
Oh, fair enough. <laughs> slightly offensive. <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. Well, but but Dave hit the note right on the um, the head. It's a weird. Yeah, mixed it. But he said, you know what? Regardless of how this book reads, it's going to sell. He said we sold out of the yeah. first issue. Oh yeah. The, the 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 trade paperback will sell. The hardcover will sell, and DC will keep it in print friggin' forever. I, so, I mean, I, I as I told you, I, I'm really plenty of times I've read a book. Like you all know, I love Victor Santos, and I was so frustrated with his last book because. It was so it read so poorly, and I don't believe it was necessarily because it was poorly written. I believe it was because, for some reason, my dude didn't see fit to pay a translator, and and the book was just really poorly broken English because of the translation. I think that's at play here as well. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not suggesting that if it was really perfectly translated, it would be all that, all the, all that particularly cohesive based on the plot. But but I do think that I do think that the translation is at play here. And either way. I'm still happy to have read it. I, I I think it's that beautiful visually. So I I just basically went back and re looked at the book without reading the dialogue balloons, and I think it it's it's a fine like it's I'm perfectly happy to have read it in that in that way. Yeah, um, as as an art object, I'll look at it again, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah. I'll be totally honest with you. I stopped reading it halfway through. You know sure. me. I, I bail yeah. at the, the the slightest. Um, I mean, I likened it to Treadmore's Doctor Strange, right? It's like no, that's yeah. way better than this. Way I don't better. Think so not from a writing perspective. No, I, I, mean, I, I do. It looks beautiful, but I don't. I mean, yeah, well, I, to each I, his own. But I, I mean, I thought that was almost. Uh, that's kind of a cop out to well, each I, his own. I, 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 well, no, I, I mean, I, well, I said I think Doctor. I think the Doctor Strange book was was was. We, I mean, I've read that whole thing versus this is only one issue, but, but right. they, it, 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 that was incomprehensible to me, too. I, I thought it was pretty nonsensical. But. Well, what I mean, is it self-indulgent? Hell yes. But rightly so, when you have one man doing everything. See, of course it's going to be self-indulgent to a certain degree, right? Yeah. Because, you know, it's Trad Moore's Doctor Strange. But I, I thought that— I mean, listen, the dude, the dude sold one issue for, for like $300,000. So right. I'm, I'm, who, who, I think he could take my criticism. I sure. Think I, but I, I did not think the story was at all incomprehensible. I thought it was on point, uh, a little a little dense, not in a negative sense. But, I mean, you had to do some, some diving to get to the, you know, the golden ring. So I, I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was there, great. He could. There's definitely with, with Trad. I think I I think there's room for improvement. There were the, the pacing was fine. It was like you said, Vince. It was dense in spots. But I, as as a Doctor Strange story, I think it hit the nail on the head. I I, I enjoyed that as a Doctor Strange. Story. Yes, it looked great, but it didn't read really as badly as Doctor Strange stories from the 60s or 70s to me. It, it, it's fair. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's kind of it, far out there. So yeah, I, I, I had no problem with it. I kind of knew what I was getting into. I mean, even though we, we EMs was talking it up last year and, and, and I kind of had an idea what to expect, but uh, I was still happy to see it completed and, and, and how it played out. I, I couldn't finish the first issue of, of, of the Batman book, so yeah. it, it's it is it, it. I can't really compare the two. You know, tr- appreciate when somebody can do both. You know, like right. I think so many of these, they like you see like Daniel, like taking his career into his own hands and doing doing everything, and and I feel like especially with a trad, you know, like those those two are they run in the same circles. You got to think it has something, but like one thing might have something to do with the other. But, you know, that's what makes the people who can do both really special. Yeah. You know, Dap, I, I, I wanted to say this when we were talking about it before, but Fall Sunrise is almost Doctor Strange Kobayashi Maru because he's put in an unwinnable situation. Uh-huh. And with a huge amount of luck, albeit there's a lot of luck going on for Steven in this book, but he changes the rules towards the end. And I thought that was, yeah. I thought it was great. But I, I will say, like, there's a lot of uh, Deus Ex Machina in the book. Like, stuff, stuff <laughs> yeah, helps. Absolutely. Stuff helps Doctor Strange where they just, oh, well, yeah. they came out of nowhere. But so what? It's magic. It's almost like Trad drew it, and he was just like, oh shit! All right, well, I'll just make it. Uh, anything can yeah, happen I'll make in this magic. Make sense. Yeah, I mean, that's really my point. Is is I think that there and listen, we've got a guy here in the fourth chair tonight that does it. I mean, I think we are long past the debate that maybe happened years, years ago about like, Oh, can, can artists become writers? Of course they can. M- many of my favorite creators. In fact, I think we talked about this on the 11 o'clock last year. Like it's no secret that when we do these year end awards, a, a good chunk of the people that we shower praise on happen to write and draw their books, right? Like that, that yes. I think 
when a person writes and draws a book well, it is the best comics that can it is the best that comics can be. Um, so I'm not like against that in theory, but I do think sometimes because that's like the ultimate. Sometimes people who are incredible artists, visual storytellers, maybe aren't as on point. Maybe it just takes time, but whatever with the writing. But they get the opportunity to write because their art is so strong and because their art alone will move units. And like, hey, you know, you do you. But I mean, I think in both of these cases, it's to me, I I would pay almost any amount of money to see them draw a book. But I would rather have someone help them with the scripts. All right. Then again, if grandpa comes to you and says, um, I want to do a Batman story. What are you going to oh, do? Say, sure. mm, yeah. maybe no. You just like you roll out the red carpet. I guess you can't lose. It's a Batman. Batman book's going to sell regardless. But now you have Grandpa drawing it. Yeah, dude. Or yeah, writing it. Well, listen, they yeah, priced it eight bucks, right? So it's not. Well, I mean, it's a black label book. Yeah, yeah, they're not losing money on it. No way. No. Uh, without not not to rehash it or go down that, but as far as for completion's sake, there was a um, a a tone deaf racial controversy regarding Jeff Loeb uh, back during um, when Iron Fist was premiering on Netflix. And it was a whole East Asian and and it was basically, he just, he showed up at, at San Diego wearing a karate gi and a headband. It was just, it was, uh, okay. it was poor taste. But, and and so I remember that, but as far as, yeah, I don't think, the, the, the canceling obviously didn't. Um, you know, I had completely forgotten that he was the one of the showrunners on Lost. Yes. Oh, yeah. Because I'm rewatching Lost. And Heroes too, but yeah. Oh yeah, I'm rewatching. I remember Heroes. I remember, I'm rewatching Lost with Holden. Uh, well, it's his first time, obviously. But and first of all, like I know this. Like it, I forget in today's world how long these fucking shows used to be when they're on the network. Yeah. Like Lost it was tw- like twenty four hour long episodes a season. Like like imagine having to do that today. Like we make 24 movies every year for seven years. Like that's in crazy. Um, but yeah, but every time I'm like putting on episodes, like, Oh, you know, showrunner producer, it's like Jeff Lopen, like, Oh shit. I'm like, God damn. Okay. So, yeah. And I believe Brian K. Vaughn wrote for it too, although not until later seasons. He did. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Tony, what you reading? Uh, well, I was going to talk about Ronan, so I'm glad we covered that. Well, we uh, I mean, you didn't give your... I mean, I had to say the, the same things that, that you were saying, uh, you know. So uh, you're enjoying the experience of it? Yeah, for sure. Okay. The same the same way I would, if Raphael Grandpa puts out a comic book, I'll buy it. If Frank Miller puts out a comic book, I'll buy it. Uh, just because, like, <clears throat> I like watching his journey... I like watching his, his his change and evolution, and I think a lot of people like he was so much raw power that even when you're far away from your prime, there's it's still interesting to look at. And also, when uh, Philip Tan works off his layouts, I think it's like the coolest looking Philip Tan shit I ever saw as well. So, uh, yeah, there's that. I read um, Tom Scholey's uh, Stan Lee book. Did any of you guys read that? I have it. Have it. He, Haven't read it. To, he sent it those copies, but I have not read it yet. Um, but uh, yeah, in fact, I believe he's asked to if he maybe come on the show and talk about it. So we do have to read it. But uh, no, how was it? Uh, I'll give you my quick take because because I'll let you guys do like sure. the full eleven o'clock breakdown after you do, 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 talk to him. Um, it's cool. I like this for Tom Scholey. Like I feel like this is a, a great. Um, use of of like his particular skill set you know like like chronicling um and sort of like biography like being a biographer like this um i like the jack one better because i feel like it was a little more narrative and this one is more uh like a montage almost like a like you know the first 40 minutes of elvis where it just sort of like keeps moving and moving and moving and you're, you're picking up all the information of this guy's origin story um this that's what this book feels like it never <clears throat> really slows into a narrative it just sort of keeps hitting hitting you with with information over and over again um so it's almost like a like a, a book length trailer that's I mean. that's how i felt about jim rugg's hulk book yeah oh yeah for sure it felt like yeah, a best right. like a best of you know, just all knitted together in, in, in some semblance of a story. There was a story because you're going from incident to incident, but it didn't seem like there was a 
a grand design, uh, you know, pun intended. So well, this one, um, like I said, I felt like the, the Kirby one uh, had more of, well, obviously, like Tom Scholey, I think, has uh, has a deep love for Jack Kirby, and I feel yes. like this one was yes, probably sure. more dim than, than this one. Um, and this one, you know, I don't think he dislikes Stan. Like, he def- there's definitely affection there. Um, but it it just felt a little, like, not as special as the Kirby one. But still worth a read. And like I said, I, I dig the... Like I dig this for him. I would if he does a, a Ditko one, I would read that. Or if he, you know, if he does like a, a Will Eisner one or whatever, like follow, I hope he follows his bliss because I have a feeling these probably sell like crazy. Yeah. You know, like I'm sure Ten Speed Press wants him to just keep making these forever. Um, There's only a, a handful of people that could ever get me to read a book on Stanley, and and Tom I think is the top of that list. For sure. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, because they like it seems like every five years they put out a comic book about Stan Lee these days, or a book. I mean, there's been so many yeah. books written about him too. Yeah. Um, so this one's interesting. I just, I guess that's my my only critique of it would it would be that I wish there was a little more narrative, um, because like the lead up to it, hearing like hearing Tom talk about it and sort of like hearing what this is going to be, people described it as sort of like a tragedy or like a horror story. Obviously, it goes all the way through to the end. So, like, things get really dark at the end, you know, and um, and and I just like I feel like that could have hit a little harder. I don't know. It just by by way of not sticking around for a long time on any one of these uh, stories or segments or anything, just it seemed like more like cramming to get all the stuff in than than being able to like sort of sit and breathe and t- and tell parts of the story you know like where where some of these things where like you know towards the end of his life he's getting taken advantage of or like he's going through family trouble or you know working with the wrong people like I, that's the stuff where i was just like i'm interested in this like there has to be you know i, I, I want to see what happened here and that is sort of just as uh we move past that just as quickly as we move past like oh when i came up with ant-man you know mm-hmm. So I dig it. Uh, obviously, I think, you know, people already have their mind made up on this one if they read the Kirby one. You know, like if, if you dug the Kirby book, you should definitely read this because it's a it's a a nice companion to it. And it and it, it is a, a well-made book. It's a good book. I just wish it was a little more narrative, I guess. It's my only criticism of it. Does that make sense? You haven't read it yet, so you don't know. Yeah, no, but, but I think the important thing, too, for me, what you're just talking about is that I wasn't sure – where Tom sat with with Stan because we all know how much he loves Kirby. So I I thought I wondered if this was going to have a decidedly negative bent to it. Um, okay. So it doesn't sound like it does. It's not acidic or like you know it's not like vengeance for Jack. Like it's yeah because that last Stanley whatever that last Stanley biography came out was was non was nonsense in my opinion. So like but so I, I'm glad to hear that. And again, we don't have to relitigate this. Stan was certainly a flawed man. There's plenty of room for criticism when we talk about his uh, his life. But 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 I I also think you 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 cannot you cannot do of justice of about talking about the man without also praising the positives he had on the industry. So it has yeah. to be balanced. I mean, come on, we know Tom. Tom Tom is a sweetheart. He's he's yeah. an ex- exceptionally nice person. He's level headed. He's a thinker. Uh, he overthinks many oh, things sure right true. so i i did not expect this book to be a a scathing uh portrayal of stan i i i pretty much pegged it to be exactly what tony said it was nice well and just to even the scales a little bit uh, i have not read it yet but surely at the same time as the stan lee book comes out he puts out another jack kirby book just I, just so p- people know where he stands uh i picked up the star warriors starring adam star and the solar legion which I'm still trying to figure out what the fuck it is. Like I'm trying to wrap my head around this. It's Jack Kirby did three issues of a of a sci-fi pulp comic when he was 22 years old. Yep. And they were serialized short stories in another book. And Tom has like recontextualized them or re. But I don't know. Did he redraw them too? Like I'm not quite sure. It says remixed by Tom Scholey. So I'm not sure. What the, I'm gonna have to listen when you guys have him on to hear what the actual. Right. I bought that today, and there was no way I was just going to uh, chow that down before exactly. the episode. So I have it on the side, and I'm gonna, I was going to read it, uh, oddly enough, for next week. 
Yeah, I got back uh, like an hour before the show, and I, was, I crammed a couple issues just so I'd have some some new shit to talk about. But I saw this, and I was like, no, I want to definitely spend time with this. It's yeah. beautiful. I didn't even crack it open because I didn't want to be tempted. So I do not know what it is. <laughs> like, I'm <laughs> curious as to what exactly it is. Cover's great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it looks beautiful. But yeah, Stan Lee, I Am Stan, a graphic biography of the legendary Stan Lee. You should check it out. Don't take my word for it, but I'm done. They so. should take your word for it. Because you're you're right. you're an authority on the subject. Right. Yeah. I want to talk about a book that Jason absolutely hates. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. I wonder why I came strong at the open. But uh Dap and I enjoyed it a lot. So uh we're gonna talk about Children of the Vault number oh, two. Oh, you're so nonsensical. <laughs> Nonsensical. Oh my God. Chil- Tony, did you read Children of the Vault number two? I don't even know what this is. Really? What? Wow. Oh, Marvel you X bet. book? What? Jay's the first issue, my dude. Dude, Jay- I guess you're I guess you're falling behind, Tony. That's cool. That's all right. He's he, hey, he's making money. Can Jason, can you give him the nickel description of what exactly the children of the vault are? I'm I'm just shocked that he that he doesn't have any reference to the children of the vault like that kind of hurts my heart dude like um i mean so well okay the children of the vault are a group of hyper evolved humans basically they are uh, they were introduced by i think mike carrie and pacello in their run of the x-men way back in the day uh basically they are in this vault that is um temporal shifted so they go through thousands and thousands of years inside the vault for every day that we go through. And as a result, the beings in there are fucking super beings because they've evolved many, many, many times over. And they got a beef with the mutants. And they've been... Uh, uh, and and during this Hickman, Gillen world, this Krakoa part of, of, of the X-verse, they've been an undercurrent because... They've been in the vault, and there's been a few times where it looked like they were going to escape from the vault again, and Forge set up this really cool uh, setup where they did escape the vault, but if they, they always knew that if they, if they escaped the vault, the world would be destroyed. So he basically set up this idea where they thought that they escaped, and they thought that they took over the world, and it was all just kind of in their heads. But uh, but this miniseries is where they realized the, the okie doke. They realized that Forge was fucking with them, and they actually have escaped from the the captivity and they are taking over the earth and this is right after the x-men hellfire gala nonsense where almost all the mutants are gone from the earth and so they are kind of running wild on on the planet and you got cable and uh and bishop essentially who are two of the only mutants left on earth trying to fight the good fight and it, this book has got a real strong Squadron Supreme vibe. It's that kind of thing. It's like, what if superheroes took over the planet type of a thing? And they seemed benevolent, but are they really? Yes. So, go ahead, Vince. Uh, what Jason forgot to say is, is it's awesome. And <laughs> it, it's written by Dennis Camp, uh, illustrated by Luca Maresca. Yes. With Carlos Lopez on color and absolutely jaw-dropping covers by Yannick Paquette. So the thing that amazes me about this book, one of the things anyway, is that Camp is setting up the children in almost exactly the same position as the mutants once occupied. They bring gifts of knowledge and technology to the to humanity. The the children have the luxury of resurrection with the whole evolution thing that that's what the mutants were doing they were resurrecting right and um they are uh in the position of let's just say authority right the 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 humans are looking to them for guidance and counsel and and information and all that stuff so basically the the mutants are no more in quotes and now the the children have have ascended to that throne i think that's pretty damn brilliant to 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 uh, knock the mutants down a whole bunch of pegs and just uh, reposition these these children in that slot, I think it's neat. But the thing that I had a giggle at um, was there's a montage in the beginning of the book where all of these threats befall the planet, and the first one straight out of the gate, this Atomo eighty two single handedly eradicates the Marvel zombies. Just just takes them right out. Like, th- th- as a threat, the Marvel zombies, 
on a scale of one to ten, I think the uh, the Marvel zombies are about a ten on the threat scale, right? I mean, because the contagion just spreads so easily. This guy just boom knocks him out in like what four panels? Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. Um, then they they beat down the the Shi'ar uh, invasion. The uh, Shumagorath pops up. <laughs> one of the great old ones. Uh, here's a, a little uh, question. First appearance of Shumagorath. Do you guys know? No, no, I don't. Marvel premiere number nine by Engelhart and Bruner. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they bitch slap my man Terax. Yep. My second favorite Herald of Galactus. They bitch mm -hmm. slap him because he was trying to set him up, uh, set himself up as a new god, which is a very curious choice of words. Um, and they just like, boom, Terax is gone. Terax is freaking tough. So, yes, I get it. The children are very, very strong. And uh, they're just going around just tamping out fires, which is great. Uh, then another insight into the the strife behind the scenes with the children. The, the, you know, it's not all uh, peaches and cream within the ranks because you have the traditionalists, of which uh, Capitan is one, who just wants to raise the planet, kill all of humanity, and just, you know, start over. And then there's the evolution, elevationists with, <laughs> with Serafina who want to take a more progressive approach to dealing with humanity. I just I think the book is phenomenal. And Cable, like greatest mutant ever, is at the forefront of this thing. It's fun. Like I don't I you know, it's I go in in phases, <laughs> right? Where I'll I'll pull away from the X-books because, you know, there's there's a downtrend, but then sometimes I'll check them out and it's like all the books are clicking and this book is the one at the top of the the list that's really working for me. Like I think it was a very steep price to pay, jettisoning the, the Hickman stuff, but I'm not saying this book makes it all worth it, but this is a nice little salve on that still open wound, right? You sold me. It's I really guess. good. It's very yeah. good. Oh, that that Pachalo carry stuff when, when this came out, I just had completely forgotten about him. Uh, but this sounds great. I'll tell you why I did not know it existed is because that logo is so terrible that uh, mm -hmm. if I saw it in a comic store, I would just keep looking. I got a real ongoing beef with the, the graphic designers at Marvel. I don't love them. Uh, but but this book sounds great. I'll pick it up and I'll just not read it in public. Well, and, and Vince, you took so off. One of the coolest things about the book is Atomo because it's obviously Atomo eighty two. It's a it's a it is a basically it's what if Akira was was in was in the Marvel universe right and cool. right and the name too right I mean, that's what I mean the name is a, a direct right to tip Akira, of the hat so yeah. yeah but just to take out the super guardians oh yeah we we eradicated all the the Shi'ar that were that were here we got rid of them We're like what and we we got rid of a Lovecraftian cosmic uh, old one yeah no big deal. The uh, the I, I enjoyed the second issue because you get you, you I mean for anybody interested in seeing Bishop in action in air quotes how he infiltrates the the compound to get to the weapons but um, you also have Cable playing interrogator and it just I I don't know if the timing was just right because the past few episodes as as we got near the end of the foundation season finale like th there were there were parts of it especially with cable where just it the the mind tricks and and just how everything was presented and 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 the reveals um reminded me of some of the sleight of hand i saw this season but it i i like the second issue a lot the first issue was fun because it, it set everything up and 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 gave you a sense of what to expect but uh now that we're past that and Cable and, and Bishop are moving forward with their plan uh, and, and we're seeing some more conversations between the children um, um, as where I felt at the end of the first issue and I was like yeah no, I'm going to check out the second issue and see where it goes now I'm, I'm, I'm more in now with this issue to see where we're going than I was last month nice nice 
I mean, well, I, I was locked in. But you Tony, were, yes. Tony, uh, Cable is um, plundering the mind of this this uh, vault member that they captured called Martillo. I like this character because he's very sensitive to the arts, right? He, he's outside of a club and there's people dancing and they're living it up and having a good time. And he's listening to the music and he's, he's – because – Dancing in, in, is forbidden, it, you know, with the children. That's that's not a, a productive uh, thing to do. And he's just he's, he's feeling some kind of way looking at all these humans enjoying themselves. But the bishop and, and Cable get him, and Cable's trying to 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 crack open that mind, and he's struggling and he's struggling. And there's a metaphorical battle going on, in addition to Cable sitting there in a chair. Just talking to this this character, um, he Cable fights this giant, and you're like, what's what is happening? And it, it, it's it's a symbolic battle. He's trying to crack this guy's brain and get into his secrets, and he does. But I mean, when you first encounter this this second tier narrative thing that's going on while Cable is having a conversation with this guy. You don't know, like, what is what is this thing that's going on? Like, did this happen before the incident? Did it happen after the incident? No, it's simultaneous, and it's awesome. And it's not telegraphed. It's not, there's no, um, you know, editor's note, like, this is a battle on the, land, on the mindscape <laughs> of, you know, they don't spoon feed you at all. Unless someone's speaking in a different language, then there's like 137,000 editor's notes. You know, translated from the Chinese, translated from like they, they're very quick to tell you that the thing in the brackets is not the English language. Like, thank you. I think yeah. we're we're attuned to that by now. But anyway, <laughs> it, this is a really good book, a very good book. Yeah. Oh, look, I'm going to give it a shot. I have not read a Dennis Camp. Uh, I didn't read 20th Century Men, so I'll check this out. I'm with you on the logo, too. It's very 90s. 20th Century. Mm. Oh, it's very indie, indie. yeah. yeah. No, ch- the Children of the Vault logo. I, I, I'm not a fan of it either. You say 90s, and I, I take that personally. I've, graphic I, design in the 90s, not comics in the 90s. Like desktop publishing graphic design? like that Yes. Like wing bats and stuff? That, yeah. <laughs> wing bats. Yeah, nice. wing bat. <laughs> I got installed yeah, this wing bat font. This is great. Yeah. I downloaded it off the LimeWire. It's great. <laughs> All right, what else? I got a shit ton of books to talk about. Dude, same, same. I got to say, it's uh, it's been nice to, after a, a slog of a few few months where I was like, man, comics is a struggle. Uh, it's been nice. A lot of stuff's been hit lately. But nothing has hit recently like, and I see it's on Daft's list too, so I'm hoping he's feeling it too. But Rare Flavors number one came out. There we week. go. Oh. And... This was a highly anticipated... Well, you're about to find out. This was a highly anticipated book because it is the same creative team that gave us the many deaths of Layla Starr, uh, a.k.a. Jono's book he wants to be buried with. Um, But no, I mean, but but many deaths of Layla Starr was an absolute triumph. And so when this crew is getting back together, it's Ram V on the writing, Felipe Andrade, and uh, and World Design is the uh, the letter. Um, But when they were getting back together... For this book, I thought, no-brainer just because of the creative team, for sure. Um, but they're playing in the same the same waters that they played with at Many Deaths of the Star in that Ram is taking aspects of, um, of, of Hindu polytheistic lore and telling really compelling, very human modern stories with it. And this book is a miniseries that centers around a, um, and I don't know if I'm saying this right, Rakshasa, it's R-A-K-S-H-A-S-A, it's basically an Indian demon, uh, named Ruben Baksh, and he is walking the earth. He kind of looks, in the book, he's he's a very robust guy, looks kind of like uh, the Shadow King, right? Like Emil Farouk, that's kind of what he looks yeah. like. He's wearing sunglasses inside, he's got a suit, he's, he's got a top hat, he, you know, he's a pretty, pretty dope looking dude. And we're introduced to him at an, at an art museum, and he's looking at this giant mural of himself, of, 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 of a painting of, of him as a demon being uh, attacked by a famous uh, hero of, of, of Indian history. And he is – now, we know he's a demon, but, like, he doesn't really act like a demon. He, we see his inner narrative as, 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 the, as, you know, 
thought bubbles and he's on a quest essentially uh to experience and chronicle the very best of indian cuisine and not like haughty toddy michelin star cuisine but like just the roots like the core like the best examples and he even references in this first issue that he he's he was inspired by anthony bourdain he wants to mm-hmm. you know which so again if you're like a foodie like that and i feel like that like that that's like that like hits you at the heart because like you, you know immediately if you're familiar with anthony bourdain rest in peace you knew you know exactly what the vibe of this is going to be then because anthony was about experiencing the world and its culture through food but very much more than just food and he's going on this journey but he wants to find someone to help him chronicle his his journey uh through mumbai and so he sets up a meeting with a young documentarian and the documentarian is actually at this point when they meet uh has given up on his filmmaking dreams because he's been pretty much of a failure and he he's he's just he's dejected and 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 disenfranchised and um ruben box the the character the demon in question is like no i mean i'll you know i'll make it worth your while i want you to do it here and they kind of have a back and forth and that kind of sets the narrative structure of the book and Ruben says, well, let me, I'm just a great, he's like, I'm a great storyteller. I love food. I'm a great storyteller. Let me tell you a story. And he tells you a story. And then in the middle of this comic, this first issue is this inter- interstitial all about a gentleman who has a chai tea recipe that he learned from his grandmother. And, a, and it's like this meticulous undertaking of his learning about chai tea and the making of it and how it was the best chai tea around. And he tells this story and it's like, it's seemingly an interstitial unrelated per se, other than him telling the story, almost like a thousand and one Arabian nights kind of a thing. And they go back and forth. And yet there's this undercurrent of like, well, what is this about? Why is Ruben, this demon care about human food in this way? And if you know anything about, uh, Rakshasas, they're, they're basically, they're, they're human eaters. They're demons that eat humans. So if you knew that you're like, okay, there's something at play here. And that unfolds. And he's trying to get Mo, who's the documentarian to sign on. And Mo's reluctant, but, you know, they go back and forth. I'll leave it to you to figure out if, if he signs them on or not. Um, but it was just incredible. I mean, there's so many layers to this. And as a lover of food and like the journey of it, like that definitely played a role here because it's clear that at least whether I don't know if Ram is is just generally a foodie or if he, he really went deep into that culture for this story. But man, oh, man, it just there was such a meticulousness to the way he described the food and the passion that he put behind it. Uh, I was just completely enraptured with the whole thing. And Andrade is an incredible storyteller, and the visuals here are just on point from start to finish. And I just can't wait to see how this whole. And I have to say, there's lots of questions left. I mean, this this first issue gives us more questions than answers. But I mean, I'm here for that because Layla Starr did the exact same thing, and at the end, it wrapped it up beautifully with a, a bow and 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 then some. So I have no doubt they'll do it again this time. And this was an absolute home run. And Dap, I hope you completely agree with me. <laughs> I, uh, I I am one of the few fools on the Slack who hasn't read Lay of the Star. Um, so this is my first experience with this creative team. Um, it's a beautiful book. It's it, it. I I I couldn't stop reading it i i just i started during lunch got back to work late i just i i couldn't put it down i i i, I saw the bourdain thing which made me chuckle because i'm in i'm when i'm futzing around in the kitchen i'm i'm either watching no reservations or, or parts unknown just because i've haven't seen many of those episodes from either series so i'm just watching those at the same time but um yeah i i thought this was a and then you made me chuckle because uh i'm thinking about across the spider verse when miles is telling um <laughs> this spider-man india that uh oh yeah i like chai tea he's like it's not chai tea you just say chai it's like you, you don't it because it, it's what it means but it was the the seeing the whole watching the um the breakdown of how to prepare the masala chai and then listening reading the story of this man and his grandmother's recipe and, and owning the stalls and then the pandemic hitting it. I, I was completely enamored by, by this story. I, mm-hmm. I, I couldn't look away. I cannot wait for the second issue. I'm already dreading 
the series as it continues because the last page I think kind yeah, of yeah. gives some things away. So I'm just sure. like, and and I don't know if that's if, if that's a trick they did in their previous series, but it's just yeah. I mean, there's so much in here that um, almost on every page is something that's going to hook you to keep you reading and and uh, the series, not just continue through this issue, but I mean, to find out where the hell the story is going. There's there's so much in here to uh, to just kind of take you along for the ride. Uh, I I yeah I'm I'm totally in. I I'm I loved it. I thought uh, I don't know. Oh, it it may it may be the best thing I read this week. Um, but yeah, I I, I absolutely had a. Uh, had a blast with it. I, I think it's great. I think whether you're a, uh, the foodie or gourmand or just enjoy well done comics, I think everybody should check this out. Hell yeah! I I, I know that anytime there's a comic about food, you and I are going to overlap and like it. Yes, I hopefully we'll definitely like. I mean, we'll definitely both check it out. And yeah, we'll see where it goes. But I mean, yeah, I mean, we've read Starve. We've read uh, yeah. I mean, there's so much that we've we've read over the years. Yeah, there was the one, I can't think of the name right now, which is a shame, but the one where the graphic, the one about the brother who discovers the, 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 the plants, then he opens up the restaurant and goes crazy. Remember that one? Um, Yes. Yeah. What the hell was that called? Uh, Damn. I can't remember it right now, but we both loved it. Shit. (sighs) Oh, well, anyway, we're getting to the side, but yes. So good. I got it. I just had not read it. It's, it's oh. one of the ones that I got home from the shop, and I was like, "I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna rush through that." The delicacy. Yes, thank you. Yes, mm-hmm. and there was Brian Lee O'Malley's seconds, which I enjoyed. Which is, I enjoyed that much more than I enjoyed his better known work. So yeah, no, I'm I'm a fan of the the food comics work for me. Yeah, I'm still I mean, for thirds. What's that fucking guy doing? What's that? So I'm still out here waiting for thirds. What's he doing? The ten years. Uh-huh. Ago. Uh-huh. And even the um, uh, to to eat and to drink the, uh, the those oversized books that Oni puts out from the French dude those are those are I mean they're not sequential storytelling like what the other books we've mentioned but it's still just um, yeah I, I it's it's weird I mean yeah obviously comics can be used to tell all sorts of different stories but but it is neat when uh, when your um, when your hobbies or your interests tend to yeah. uh, overlap like that. Uh, I decided to give a number one a shot. I think this came out last week or week before. Batman and Robin by uh, Joshua Williamson and uh, Simona DeMeo, of course. Um, they only uh, leave someone when they're dead. Uh, the illustrator for that sort of series. Um, this was... I. It's you know it's it's got the whole dawn of DC the banner on the cover. Uh, I I wanted to I read it because I wanted to check out the art because I really really do like the male's work. But uh, this is um, obviously some things have changed in in Bruce's life and uh, he and um, Damien are basically it's kind of like a brownstone that, that that they're living in. They don't have the mansion. They don't have uh, the cave uh, because I guess there's things going on between Bruce and Selena. Um, But uh, Damien isn't too thrilled because Bruce is actually um, has uh, enrolled him in a, uh, in in high school, even though, you know, Damien's like, this is anything. I'm smarter than anybody in that school, even the teachers, no matter what they're going to teach me, but 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 Bruce is like, no, you're, and and at first name it's like, oh, this is great because I've got so many like you know, identities and 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 undercover guys as I want to use, and 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 Bruce is like, no, dude, you're you're going as the son of Bruce Wayne, Damien Wayne, you're going to school, and uh, and and yeah, you know, I'm I'm with Bruce here because listen, you know, I want you to kind of just be more well rounded and be around. The kids your age and and uh you know understand kind of what that so-called normal life could be like it and and uh you know the, you, <laughs> you grew up with the league of assassins it's kind of you know maybe get the the other side of that but there's um there's definitely uh some other things going on the the the, the issue starts off with um 
with Batman and Robin um, taking out the White Rabbit and her goons. Um, and the issue wraps up more or less with a uh, confrontation with the um, with the terrible trio. And they're really not uh, the trio we're, we're familiar with. And uh, it's man bats also involved in this, uh, in this robbery. Um, so things really don't go the way our heroes had intended. Um, someone actually fires a shot in Batman's direction. Um, and the pellet actually hit Batman and he breathed it in. It's not poison, but he's saying it's something else. Um, and, uh, and then all of a sudden, all of these bats start appearing and, and flying towards them and they're, um, and they're heading right towards Batman, um, in attack mode. And, and that's, that's, how the first issue ends with a hell of a cliffhanger, but um, it's a beautiful looking book. I, I, I'll probably check out an issue here or there. I don't know if it's something I'll, I'll be back for next month to see how Batman gets out of this predicament. But, um, you know, I, it's, it's aside from super sons, it's kind of like the most Damien I've read in a minute. And, uh, and 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 I wasn't annoyed. I I really I, I kind of just I just sat back and just saw where this was going. And and as far as the first issue and and setting up a new kind of I don't know if status quo is the right word, but this is you know this is where Bruce and Damien are going to be, and 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 uh, and we'll see what they might have to deal with when they don the the capes and the cowl. But as far as father and son, uh, that that's kind of what I'm. I was I was kind of grooving to that in the middle section of uh, of the issue, but yeah, I um I I I dug it. I mean, I'm not I, I I can't say I loved it like you know Austin loves it, but it's still <laughs> it. Uh, but then again, it's a Batman book, and I don't think anybody can love anything related to Batman as much as uh, Austin does. But uh, no, this was this was pretty cool. It was uh, it was just it was a it was a first issue. I felt like trying. Glad I did. Definitely didn't uh, feel like a waste of time at all. I think uh, I, Williamson can write some stories. We know that, but yeah, for for me, it was the uh, the art was the the selling point in this one. But yeah, if if, uh, if you're in the mood for it, definitely check it out. B and R, baby. Tony. Yes. You read Remender's Sacrificers yet? No, I got the free comic book day, and then I haven't picked up the the new issues. Do we love it? Uh, well, I'm only could speak for myself, but I, I I think it's great. Yeah, it's very slow burn though, extremely slow. Oh yeah, this is gonna be a long one. Yeah, um, for those of you who don't know, written by Rick Remender, illustrated by Max Fiumara, with uh, Dave McCaig is doing the color art. Second issue. Uh, picks up right after the first one um pigeon boy is still being dragged to wherever the uh the f- sacrificial people are being taken by this character the foreman of the harvest really cool looking character um but the nice part about this issue was we're given more insight into what's going on in this world like there are multiple races human bird reptile and and Jason, did you read this issue? I haven't read two yet, actually. No. Um, There's anthropomorphic whales. Oh shit! Yes. Damn it! But so I won't say. Well, there's not really much to reveal about the 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 story in the second issue. It, there, it's just a, another dragging these poor souls to wherever they're 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 uh, being taken, and you get to see a nice little cross-section of of the the races i i didn't think it was uh, a coincidence that the humans are greedy violent jealous assholes right and um oddly enough like the way he's drawn pigeon boy doesn't look too intelligent or at least mm-hmm. he at least yeah. he didn't but i have to say he's the wisest character in this book 
They're, the whales are enlightened, so to speak. They they preach patience and and you know unity and all this stuff and uh, pigeon boy is just like he the, there's a scene at, at where they're they're being they're being fed uh, or they're they're eating and um, th- like I said the humans are are brutal just uh, savages uh, no time or or inclination for any race other than their own I mean it's typical right and the uh, Pigeon Boy's just like, what are you guys doing? Like, let's just stop. Like, stop fighting. We don't know where we're going. See, that's the thing. As in our real world, all of the individual races think they have it all figured out. Mm-hmm. Like, they know where they're going. They know what their 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 fates are going to be, or, or in some cases, rewards are going to be. And Pigeon Boy's like, you, you don't know where we're going. You don't have it all figured out. It, but it, I, I just thought it was a neat little insight by Remender into the current state of things, so to speak, that there are many of us that do believe that they have it all figured out and their way is the only way. And they, they preach their way to other people who may or may not subscribe to that magazine, right? And it's just, it, I, there, I think there's, there's a lot more going on here than a bunch of different races being taken for whatever. Like Remender saying something in this book, and I thought it was really, really well done. Uh, Fuimara is uh, an absolute monster. Yep. He is. Oh God, yeah. He tears up every page. Like every page is gorgeous. Um, I mean, I'm a, I've been a fan since the, the Hellboy stuff or the Ape Sapien stuff. So always on my radar. But I think this is again whatever Remender feeds his artists. Like I don't want to say uh, Max leveled up, but I think this stuff looks even better than the the Ape Sapien stuff. And which was gorgeous, but I, Remender has that that knack for just pulling the the best out of his his, you know, co-creators, and this is just more of the same. Loved it, loved it a lot. I like it a lot. Yeah. I thought the first issue was very heavy on the cosmology of what's going on in this world. This was more of the same, but it wasn't as talky, uh, you know, as as the first issue. It was more uh, show don't tell kind of thing. And mm-hmm. I liked it. I liked it a lot. Nice. Ditto. Yeah. But Tony, you got to read it. I definitely will. Like I said, I, I read the free comic book day and then I just, I think it came out and I sort of missed that it was coming out. It looks beautiful. You're right. That Rick Remenda really uh, he pulls something out of artists. They really, it's like they want to impress him or something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like I pushed through the scumbag. Um, I did Not my favorite thing he's ever done but man no, those, those artists were like knocking it out of the park every issue mm-hmm. yeah. that really had the most beautiful diarrhea in it <laughs> <laughs> what's what's not beautiful about diarrhea it's just so well drawn and like it was in motion you know it's wild yeah it's nuts speaking of diarrhea um <laughs> wow this is a little aside i was watching this, on reddit there's this video this this poor soul Go is 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 at a. Uh, it looks like he's at a phone store, and um, you don't see him enter. So he may have been in there for a, a, who knows how long, right? And he's walking back and forth and back and forth. And the person at the counter is doing their thing, and he's walking back and forth, and he's pretending to look at the phones. And he, so he walks up to the counter, and I guess the woman behind the counter was talking to him, and the dude just unleashes this river of shit down his leg on his feet right and so the woman's still talking to him so he's, he's walking in his own crap and he's dragging it <laughs> he's dragging it down and i'm like how many of us have dreaded that situation like we're human right that shit kind of happens literally right but this, somebody got it on security they, they took the security tapes and it's just like i said, I said why am i watching this <laughs> it's just yeah. you can't look away <laughs> The poor guy, though. I mean, I felt so bad for him because we've all been there, right? No front. We've all been in situations like that. Not not where you drop one on the floor, but I'm just saying, like, almost. Like, there have been some, but whatever. This is a comic show. But, yeah, Dad, you just we used to diarrhea, and that just triggered that to me because that's, mm-hmm. that's what it was. By the way, Vince, Max, Max and his brother Sebastian will be at New York Comic Con. Huh? Awesome. We'll have to throw a couple back with them. Mm. Well, maybe, yeah. You never know. You never know. Tony, uh, so what, what have you read, Tony? Let me hear. 
Uh, did we read Wonder Woman number one? Uh, yes, sir. Let's talk yes. about. It. I mean, Vince didn't because Vince is, is no he, Vince is he's a, Vince is a misogynist, but Vince is not going to read that. <laughs> but so. but Dapp and I did yes. I mean, Vince is going to. I mean, if I I I worry about the the creators of this book because of misogynists. Like this the, this thing is there's a certain online DC Comics fan that really does think that there's a war on men. Uh, and oh, it, I think I think Tom played to that. Like he he he, that was his, that was by design, right? Like he's playing to that. Yeah, yeah. What you th- what you think of it? Uh, I thought it was good. Like it really like it set up the the tone of the thing. I really wish I hadn't seen the the Wonder Woman pages as the preview because they they put those out months ago. I feel like yeah yeah. So the whole time I'm reading the issue, and then once they get to the snowy graveyard, I'm like, oh right, I know what's happening here. Yeah. So I was kind of bummed about that, but uh, as like a slow burn lead up to this story and sort of like set the, uh, it's a great first issue. Can you hear my dog just chewing on this? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Let me take care of this. Hold on a second. <laughs> you, guys, you talk about it for a minute. I'm going to make him sad. I mean, um, this was basically Amazon's attack for the new millennium, right? I mean, essentially, um, only we're seeing the aftermath, which is that. An Amazonian, presumed a presumed Amazonian, a blonde, six foot four, super tough looking woman, uh, goes into a bar and kills, I believe, nineteen men. Right, that nineteen, yes, seventeen or nineteen. It was either seventeen or nineteen, but kills a shit ton of men and leaves the women alive. And uh, apparently, that one, apparently, in a world where there are crises and gods and a million superpowers, apparently, that one act was enough. To declare Amazon's uh, not okay to be on U.S. soil, uh, that so uh, a little issue with that, but but we'll well, I guess we'll go with it because it's comics. But that incident um, leads to a presidential ban on Amazon's being in the uh, Amazonians being on our soil, and so we get Sergeant Steele, who is brought in to lead a task force of military, uh, you know cyber armored soldiers to go and enforce that rule and round up all of the Amazonians living on U.S. soil and getting them to go back to Themyscira. Um, and they are heavy handed to say the least in their methodology to the point where, uh, they are not above killing, uh, the women if they put up any kind of, uh, protest. And as a result, that invites, uh, the most famous Amazon Amazonian to, Say fuck all this. I have been here. I am worthy of being here. I have saved this. You know, I have been in this country forever. I have saved this country a million times, and I'm not leaving. And uh, that kind of sets up the structure of, I guess, at least the first arc or two of the series. Um, I thought Daniel St. Pierre's art was awesome. I I I know he did a long run on um, Batman, but I didn't read a lot of that, so I don't know that I've seen many issues of St. Pierre's art before. Um, but I thought the art looked phenomenal. So, uh, yeah, I'm here for it. I mean, um, you know, admittedly, I thought the setup was a little bit, you know, like not deus ex machina, but a little convenient. Like it seemed like we really had to go from zero to a thousand because of that one incident. But um, but nevertheless, I'm OK with the idea of a story about I mean, this is basically Tom's play on on immigrants and immigration and the government's, you know, continued um policy to make immigration very difficult if not impossible um so you know certainly i i am sympathetic to the message and i'm sure we're going to get some pretty dynamic fights along the way you know but uh but what'd you think that uh i i think sam Pierre looked better here than he did uh at the start of the um uh pkj's superman that's run. where I saw him most recently. Okay, yeah, that's where I saw him most recently. Yeah. Uh, the art's great, and and Tom's definitely telling a story. I, I think though, just right now, I am not maybe in the right headspace for a story like this. I it 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 is because it, yes, it is. It's it's timely. It's topical. Whatever you want to call it. Um, but I, it's it's. It's one of those stories where I kind of get enough of this away from comics. And while it is sure. obviously exaggerated because it's fitting in, in the comics world, it is still um, ripped from today's headlines. I, I've, I've never seen Sarge Steele this much of a dick. 
Yeah, yeah that's. I was going to ask because obviously I don't have as much DC history as y'all, and I didn't know if Sarge Steel was always. The, I mean, this guy's a straight up asshole. Like, yeah, he is. like, like, like way like worse. Ripping than, babies from their mothers type. Of yeah, asshole. and like with like pleasure, like with like, yes, and 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 even like, and I probably by design. Tommy, the point of view in saying that like. Steel compares himself to Amanda Waller and considers her like a pussy. Like so, mm-hmm. like yeah, so yeah. Uh, so that 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 took a little getting used to, and obviously, I do want to see him get his comeuppance, and mm-hmm. and you know, to to a degree, he, he kind of does in this first issue. Um, but I also it it's, I mean, it was like pretty much more than half the book before we finally see our titular heroine. Um, which again, you know, we all know what Wonder Woman looks like, who she is. It's, we don't need her to be on page one, but it definitely took a minute for us to get. And then obviously when she shows up, kicks ass and, and, and everybody definitely, um, gets what they deserve. And, and, and again, you know, he's, he's such a, uh, prickly Republican type. He's like, Oh no, no, we weren't shooting at you first. You, you attacked us. It's like, dude, I, I, I and I just, I, I, just, <laughs> I, I, I cannot stand bullies. And obviously, you know, here, here he is right on, on the page and it's just, you know, Eddie, Eddie calls Wonder Woman a bitch. And she's just like, dude, that's not a word you want to use around. I just, he, he really amped up stealing this and, um, and yeah. And, and, it's, and then I, I think the, uh, the reveal, if you want to call it with, uh, with the big bad, and and what they have in their possession i'm interested in that tom tom kind of hooked me with that so i i, I want to see where we're going with that but no the art's great daniel's a fantastic artist um and uh and and it's tom having to go with wonder woman so it should um it should because he, he does like to kind of uh mess around with things happening to a degree in the real world um it's uh it's it should be for it, it. It should make for an interesting ride. Maybe not a completely fun ride, but it should be interesting. So I'll definitely be here for for the next issue to see where we're going. Uh, but yeah, I, I like in the first issue. I I thought it did a really good job getting you ready for uh, for what's to come. I uh, it felt a lot to me like the first issue of um, Civil War. You know, like the yeah big yeah. national news headline. And, it's, and then we're going to outlaw this superhero. Yeah. Stories about them sort of coming back from, you know, sh- showing the world why we need a Wonder Woman. Um, but, and I almost, I, like, I think I could keep reading it, but I definitely did feel that sort of tinge of, like, where, where I'm just like, is, do I have the news on? You know, like, this. Right. The character was so yeah. well on. The shitheads that he wrote were such great shitheads that you're just like, is this, am I just watching TV now? Um <laughs> But well, then I for, also think about like if you're writing drama and you're writing something that takes place now, like how long are you supposed to wait before you start? You know, mm-hmm. like I'm not going to think Doctor Doom's the biggest shithead ever to try and run a country if if there's real life shit going on. You know? Yeah, I mean, Tom, we've had Tom on the show many times, and he I know has said that um, he often, uh, and it's not like this is a big secret. You can see in the work he he often works his stresses and neuroses and fears out in his yeah. books. I mean, that is right. And he said it's, he's, he's covered fatherhood and PTSD and all, all the things that he's had to deal with. And, and, and I, I think clearly he's understandably now to your, you know, you guys bring up a good point. I mean, this is one of those, it is, it is interesting because this is being billed as Tom King is certainly one of DC's top writers. And this is being billed by DC's like, Oh man, you guys have, You've always wanted it. Here's Tom King going to take his 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 his, his uh, you know his pass at Wonder Woman. It is a book though where I have to think. I don't know where the lines are delineated demographically in Big Two Comics, but you guys are right to say. Like as I was reading this, I thought, well, a bunch of us are going to be fine with this, and a bunch of people are going to be like, "Fuck this guy," right? Because like it's probably along political lines, right? Like if you're, if you're, if you're left leaning, you probably like, well, so you certainly agree with the messaging. You, you guys, it sounds like probably it's too close to home, but at least you don't like, but 
it may be too close to him for to continue it on with, but you agree with the underlying point he's making. Whereas there's a, plenty of people that buy DC comics, right? That are going to read this and be like, Oh hell no. Like, like who do believe that like the, the what American white man is being relegated yeah. to Right. And so they're going to be like F Tom King F this, you know, right. So it's going to be interesting. I mean, I will give him, I do give him credit because he does not suffer fools. Like he, He's a super smart guy, right? He's a former CIA analyst. Like he, he, he knows. Like this issue clearly says, "Bring it," right? Like he's he's inviting this controversy. Like this yeah. is not this is not like he's going to be caught unawares. This is a if you have a problem with this book, I like bring it because this is what this book's about. I I, pr- I appreciate that, right? Like I very much applaud the balls, but where that fits with like DC and this DC editorial <laughs> and the circulation department appreciate it. Well, well I guess we'll find out. I don't think it's too close for me to keep. For, like, I'm gonna keep reading. I'm gonna read the next one for sure. I just felt the tinge when I was. I was just like, hey, you know, like that's. that's <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know if you were tending to your dog when I said this. I said the the only the only criticism I'll give of it is I thought that the um, the catalyst for this uh, banning of the Amazons was I thought a little weak, right? Like, like yes, there's a, a presumably an Amazon woman kills 19 guys at a bar. But like that alone gets every like that leads to a presidential ban, right? Like that that seems. I could see. I mean, I guess it would depend on who's president, right? I yeah, it was, what, it was don't the know, though. I mean, who, uh... sadly, we have lots of examples in our country every year of mass killings, and I don't know that they've ever led to any real substantive change, right? I don't. Yeah, but there's not an Amazonian lobby, you know. Like, there's no money being. But made. there would be in the DC universe, though. But like what? But th- like for guns, there's a profit motive, right? There's not for for superhero ladies, right? Is there? I don't well, know. I'm saying in the DC universe, I would think there would be, right? Like they'd be a powerful country with with influence, right? I mean, I, I would think, uh, but but maybe not. I don't know. I mean, no. we don't I, have like we. I guess Trump tried a Muslim ban, and it, it, it fortunately the courts didn't hold it up. So I guess maybe that's the that's the uh, the I guess that's the composite, right? Yeah, I think you know you could do a a, a presidential uh, what do they call them? They, they don't fucking do them anymore when Joe Biden's in office. Executive orders. <laughs> yeah, he used to do executive orders all day long. That guy. Uh, but yeah, oh, there was a meme for it, right? Trump holding up the open, yeah, yeah, big giant, yep, yep, big yep, giant yep, like leather, time. the leather like uh, menu, and it was like a shitty shark. executive order of the day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like this thing, and I I definitely like the part. Uh, I think David pointed out when he was talking about where the guy was like, we didn't shoot first. Just the <laughs> dealing with somebody just lying, like without, yeah, you know, and with the lasso of truth and like truth being a part of the Wonder Woman story, and then the the last page twist, like obviously truth and lies are going to be a big yep part of this, and I think that ties right in with all that stuff too. So I'm I'm interested to see how how it this goes. is going to sound like it like like. Like it's not connected, but but just follow me for a second. Um, and I know this isn't new news, but like I was really stunned today with, with I'm sure we've all had, depending on your interest, examples of this. But today I was confronted with that reality, which we see all too often now, of how there is almost no truth objectively on the internet anymore. Because y'all know I'm a big NFL fan. The NFL, uh, the the Chicago Bears defensive coordinator, um, resigned. From the team, uh, which is very unusual, right, to res- for uh, someone to resign early in, in a season, and um, then it became clear that that then the news broke today that he resigned because the FBI raided his home and the Bears' offices and were accusing him of like all manner of things, including like child pornography or child abuse and stuff, right? And like this went wild throughout, like, and in my NFL circles, like this was like, holy shit, this is crazy, like what a what a what an awful story. Well, as of our time of recording, major outlets like ESPN have come out and said that's not true. Like, he resigned because of health issues, but his home wasn't raided. Like, I don't know where that came from. Like, there's no truth to that. But if you were to just to Google, like, if you're a past, like, if you're kind of like a, you know, more of like a middling NFL fan, but you hear about this, you're like, I wonder what's going on. And you just Google Alan Williams tonight and you pull up the news. You know, you just go to Google, you, know, you Google his name and you look it up. Half the articles say, that he was his home was raided by the FBI and he suspected of child you know in, indiscretions against children. The other half are like, no, he resigned because of health reasons and that's all nonsense. But it's like, I can't even tell you which is true, right? Like, I don't know if 
I, I, I wasn't in, like, I don't know for sure. But the point is, is like, if you were just someone who was like passively curious about this and you Googled it, trying to find out the truth, quote unquote, you would be left dumbfounded because there are articles from reputable sites saying he was basically a child molester and his FBI came to his home. And there are other articles saying, no, that's patently untrue. So like, and that's just like an NFL, a random NFL news story. Like, like that's the world we live in now. Like you just don't, you, you, if you go to the internet trying to find out like for yourself, like, well, let me figure out what's the truth. You do not know the truth. You cannot, like, it, it is very hard to figure out the truth. Uh, it's going to get crazier too. The AI and the like. Oh, it's a hundred percent crazy. A hundred, yeah. A thousand percent crazy. It's going to be bananas. Yeah. So, yeah. Wonderful. I know that seems like an aside, but I do think that's at the heart of what Tom's getting at here, right? Like, you're right. Like, because the, the lasso is supposed to be the lasso of truth, but like, truth is. In in 2023, truth is obje- is what subjective. You believe, yeah, yeah, it is so subjective, which is ridiculous. But that's where we are, and I think that's the message. But yeah, the cur- the curiosity is: will that message resonate in a, you know, a Trinity book? Right. Well, I mean, I think truth being built into the character, like it is that it's like I was saying, like how long do you wait? For before it's not just ripped from the headlines, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I got to say, the other thing about this book I really loved is it's a super violent book. Yeah, like yeah. like for for Wonder Woman number one, it is it is a book that's there. There are plenty of bloodshed and murder and death. Like it's like it really did take me aback because I don't. This isn't Black Label, right? Like this is DC proper, right? This is yep. Yeah. So I I was surprised. I was surprised by that. I was a little sh- I'm like the whole time I'm reading it. Like I I met Tom. Uh, for real at Baltimore just uh, last week or the week before. I'd, I'd only sort of like met him in passing before. I was on here with him, but you know, y- you guys were talking to him. I'm, I'm just, I hang back when that sort of thing happened. Um, and I, but I think he's a good dude, but the whole time there's part of me that's going like, it's crazy that two dudes are making Wonder Woman in this, in the, in the year 2023. And it's the, it's like the big launch. And then I'm reading it and they just kill a woman in front of her daughter. Yep. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, to be clear, they they killed her outside the home. The daughter runs to the other mother and says, did you hear that? And then sees her dead mother. So, yeah, but I mean, it's not like she didn't witness yeah, the murder, but she did see the aftermath. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, like the whole time I'm just like, this is crazy. Like they are really t- taken. They're not uh, restrained at all. No, they're, they're really going for it. Uh, and I don't know. We'll we'll find out how <laughs> how that plays. Definitely. How was how was Baltimore, by the way? Uh, it was uh, the business was a little slow this year. We got to hurry up and get this new book out. Uh, but the <laughs> the um like the community and the like meeting people and like I got to sort of like have face to faces with people I'm working with. A bunch of people I'm working with actually. Um, and sort of and just check-ins and like see old friends and stuff like that. That was really nice. It was a great people show. Business could have been a little better, but it wasn't like I didn't lose money. And also, um, I got family in, in Maryland. I was born out in Baltimore. And so like I do that show, I can oh, go I out. forgot you were a Charm City born and bred. Yeah. I, I, I don't talk about it much because I moved away from there when I was like 10 years old. So I don't have actual, you know, like I can't name streets or neighborhoods that I would hang out in. You know, I can just name the Legos I played with and stuff. <laughs> oh, Vince is back. He's like, oh, you must be done talking about Wonder Woman. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, when I sat in a creek, that was fun. You know, I had beer. That was mm-hmm. good. Baltimore, Baltimore were good. Ate crabs, did all the things. Yeah, yeah some crabs, nice. Yeah. Really Stone good. crabs, or what would you have? Stone? Uh, I had, uh, I just would get the, the bushels of crabs, you know. I just got a, a bucket full. Went to a place that was a little out, out of the way, and I got a bucket full of crabs at the Old Bay, and I just, you know, set nice. cracked them. Nice. Yeah. Vince, got- regale us with something, buddy. I don't think anybody read this. Well, so I would hope more than one, more than you. It wasn't a comic made just for you. No, uh, but I enjoyed it a hell of a lot, and um, maybe a little bit of apologizing to David, mm. um, because you know what? I think we were extremely um, deficient in our duties because we have never mentioned the John Romita tribute in all the Marvel books. That's true. We haven't. I mean, I think it was a really we raised the glass, but yeah, we didn't talk about those. Couple yeah. Days. Um, and while we're at it, let's raise another yeah. glass to Joe Matt. Yeah. 
All right. Mm. Yeah, yes. good point. Yes, absolutely. Yes, hate to bury it within, you know, something yeah. else. But, yeah, um, rest in peace, Joe Matt. Uh, but the Ramina uh, tribute is four pages in every Marvel comic, and that is awesome. Uh, I don't think it's enough, but I, I understand from a publishing standpoint, four pages in a comic is a lot of pages. But for many, many, many years, uh, Ramita was the face of Marvel. If if they got a cover in and they thought it needed that Marvel treatment, they gave it to Ramita to fix. Like he was the visual identity of Marvel for a good number of years. And I just think this tribute was nice. It was it was very heartfelt and and well thought out and and full of great images of that John had done. I just I, I appreciate these four pages. That's what I wanted to say. But anyway, um, I have to apologize a little bit to that because when I read who was doing the art chores on this book, I was like, oh. Because mm. because <laughs> it, it, it's yeah. never he's never been like I I mean Blows I appreciate like I said yeah. I appreciate the guy's work, uh-huh. but he's never been ding, ding, like on that that artist radar like I oh man he's done a book I gotta get it, but I, I'm it, it's Lee Garbet do the art on this I do it, and I I, what I, I I now know what crow tastes like because this book was <laughs> <laughs> it was it was really nice to look at uh, Cy Spurrier wrote it. Matt Miller did the color. It is Uncanny Spider-Man number one. Dude, you mocked the shit out of this book when I did. I did. But proof is in the pudding. Like I can't. This is the dumbest thing. Why would they make this? Uh, Why would you even make this? Is this shows you that if if you give me the information and I can digest it and I deem it worthy, I will. I'm not above telling people that. Yeah, I prejudged and I was wrong. This book was a lot of fun. The thing that got me in the door was Tony Daniel did an amazing I cover. Knew it. Amazing yep. Yep. cover. It is kinetic and it's I love this suit on Kurt. I think it looks great. The tail makes it, right? Um, but the, there's a lot of weird stuff going on in this book. Things I did not know. Like Shocker is now um a, a, a corporate entity or something uh, there there are people in the beginning stealing human organs for shocker and they have the 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 like the the padded gold shocker you know costume thing going on and i did not know that shocker was that elevated i just thought him as a two-bit villain right fun but a two-bit. i always thought of it as is as, as two in the pink one of the stink Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, yeah, if you want to get oh, like bits. lowbrow, sure, but yeah, because you're above that. Yeah. I That's am, but now there's yeah. there's about diarrhea again. They're st- <laughs> they're stealing yeah. organs, right? So naturally, Kurt as a spider, uh, bamfs in and and stops them, but he's trying to do the Peter witty repartee, and and mm-hmm. failing, you know. Uh, be, and there's a, a, a callback to this later in the book when Peter actually does show up and he's talking to Kurt. He's like, my dude, what's up? Like, I, what's going on? It, long story short, now that mutants are hunted, there's Stark, Tech, Orcus, Sentinels in this book scanning human beings to try and find mutants. Like a, a mutant will emit a pheromone that the, the Sentinels pick up on. So they're, it, I mean, it's just like the the good old days with Sentinels hunting mutants, right? Except now... It's Stark Tech, which is kind of creepy, right? It's a, we're gonna have another Armor Wars. I don't know. Before you, because I, 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 I haven't read it yet. I'm I I barely flipped through it. Um, you mentioned the quips. Does anybody? Does he try to hide his accent? Does anybody say why is Spider Man? Why does he have a tail? No, in in during? fact, they go out of their way to say what's with the accent. Like, why is he oh, okay. talking? Yes, no, he doesn't try and, and hide it at all. There's a lot of lot of you know German is German inflections and, and words in here. He's Kurt. He's he's not yeah. hiding the fact. Good. Um, yeah, but uh, the Vulture is working with Orcus. The, the Vulture's making hounds. Which I thought was really neat. He's a director, and um, he's they're they're trying to get Kurt because there's a there's an incident in the park where the the Sentinel um, scans the humans or the, the the people and detects a mutant, and something whispers in Kurt's ears like no 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 we got this don't worry about it, and the Sentinel's like hmm, 
guess I was wrong. But Toombs is not having it. He's like, that looks a lot. It looks and sounds a lot like Nightcrawler. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get the beat on him, and he calls somebody in to bring him down. And the person I won't say it because Dap didn't read it, but the person that they call in, um, I would have thought that they interacted with mutants before. In fact, I'm almost certain of it. But they're kind of acting like. I've seen this person in the news in the past and they're cute, but don't really have a whole lot of information on them. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is the Marvel universe. Everybody has interacted at one point or another. And this character is not a new character. Um, they, they're a longstanding character in the spider books. So I'm like, mm, this just seems a little, little off, but the, the thing that was whispering, and it, there's, there's a psychodrama going on with Kurt, too, because the thing that was whispering in his ear was a bamf. And it's, it's uh, like, ghostly. They're, they're semi-transparent and may not really be there. So I don't know where that's going. But I just thought the book was fun. Like, I love Kurt. I think Nightcrawler is Nightcrawler's a great character. And this yes. was, uh, I didn't think he would fit in well in the spidey suits but he's spandex yeah it's it's really neat uh the the cowl has or the the, the head mask has the de- uh, elf like horns the ears are pointy they're horned like the pointy ears which is neat it's just uh, the visually i think it works really well but again prejudged uh judged wrong so i thought it was a lot of fun is it a revolutionary take on superhero comics? No, it's just fun, right? You throw the vulture in, that's great. When did he get techno wings? His wings are all like like cir- like warlock, yeah, movies, I assume, like circuitry, movie. and and they're jagged and irregular, and there's pointy bits hanging out of them. And they look like they're illuminated from within. It's just strange. Um, but again, I've been away from the Spidey books for so long that maybe I was. Um, Actually, yeah, it kind of almost looks like Warlock. That's what I'm saying. It looks like Warlock. Yeah. Yeah. That um, I'm just starved for anything Spider-Man not connected in regular continuity. Thank you. So it was nice that Peter showed up um, another character very closely, super closely connected to Kurt, uh, makes an appearance. Again, I won't spill the beans, but I thought this was a a lot of fun. Well worth my time anyway. It's not an ongoing so no fear. No, this, I wouldn't think. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a it's a whatever miniseries, four or five issues or whatever it's going to be. So uh, a dalliance at best, but it's a fun one, right? Good. Yeah, I thought it awesome. was it was cute. Yeah, see, I mm. read I read anything Nightcrawler, like whatever. Just put put him put him like make him a Hulk. I don't care. I'll read it. Kurt's a great character. Truly is. Yes, he's troubled. He's very troubled because he wants to reclaim his name, but he can't because he's on the run. Mutants are, are feared and hunted again. He just wants to do some good. He just wants to make some change, some positive change, David. That's all. So I'm he, with him. He puts in, Peter's like, how does the tail thing work? And he's like, ah, whatever, <laughs> never mind. Yeah, it's cute. Real cute. Chances of Jason reading this are probably as high as me reading Wonder Woman. Of Jason not reading this, it probably is as high as me not reading one of them. Yeah. Um, I would say, yeah. I mean, uh, it's not a priority. That's what I'm saying. It's a mutant book. It may eventually make its way. Yeah, there. I mean, but it's like, it's a transitional mutant book, right? It's Very much so. Yeah. 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 And it's more of a Spidey book than it is a mutant book. Mm-hmm. But, but yes, there there are things directly connected to Kurt in it, but there are more things directly connected to Peter in it. Mm-hmm. So, like the Vulture's his villain or one of his villains, and the uh, the person that is contra- is is brought in to to take take out Kurt is a Spider Man character first and foremost. I think so. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. There yeah. it is. Yeah, fun stuff. Fun doesn't stuff. doesn't read like a size burger book though. 
there's not a it's not very weighty at all because I, uh, from what i've read of size barrier not not only the cross stuff but intense dude right on the page this is not that this is just fun i thought his the only stuff i read of his uh was the dr afra and that i felt was pretty light oh okay yeah maybe this is more of the same yeah there you go. Whimsic, whimsical adventure. It it kind well, I mean, there are there's some weight to it because I mean it's not a good situation for the mutants, right? And um, you know, stealing human organs is never fun. But yeah, in or big picture, big picture, it's like a swashbuckling. Kurt has a sword too. Love it. Mind God. Yeah, but it, it's not a it's not a physical sword. He he explains it in the book, and I don't I don't know exactly. Um, where this came from let me get to the page and I'll, I'll tell you if, if you care i mean if you don't care it's uh doesn't matter but he says that it's a there's like one guy's like hey where'd you get the sword and um he says uh probably not going to find it now but it's this long convoluted explanation that i didn't witness firsthand so i don't have any any form, frame of reference for it but it's a it's a glowing white sword that he just pulls out of nowhere and you know oh it, probably from 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 a uh, ten of swords yeah oh okay no from uh, when they all deflate over the swords oh that makes sense yeah like that make that, that makes a huge lot a huge amount of sense Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fun stuff. I got some. You're Mr. Marvel these days. Like, for real, though. What a cycle. No, nah, I'm just in a, in a mood to have fun. Like, I don't, yep. I, nothing, uh, everything I read doesn't have to, you know, be socially relevant or, or, or crack the internet. I just want to enjoy myself. Mm-hmm. And, and this book did that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nostalgia mm-hmm. is the driving force, Jason, right? Mm-hmm. This is true. We doing more, or what are we wrapping it up? What's going on? Oh, we could do we do more. Let fly. I got something I think is gonna uh, make Vince very happy. Uh, okay, I, that's why we're here. I had my pile of books here. I was like, this is a pretty Vincey pile here because I had my Ronin, a Vincey pile. He says. I had my uh, Tom Scholey, Jack Kirby, Star Warriors, to a lesser extent that Stan Lee book. Uh, but at Baltimore Comic Con, I stopped by the Tomorrow's Publishing bo- booth. <gasps> They had a book there that I did not even know existed. It just came out from them. Um, <clears throat> it's the best of Simon and Kirby's mainline comics uh, featuring the complete bullseye Western scout. Wow. Uh, so it's Jack Kirby Western comics in this oversized, beautiful hardcover collection. Um, it's from like 1955 Simon and Kirby stuff. Um, uh, I, I obviously haven't read the whole thing. But I've been pouring over it because not only is the artwork beautiful, it's different looking Kirby stuff. Like it's it's his more grounded stuff, but this Western stuff is just really sharp. Um, but what made me really pull the trigger because I've skipped uh, like I don't have the entire you know like Jack Kirby archive. Um, I've skipped some of this older like pre Marvel stuff. Um, but what made me jump on board for this one was the restorations. Uh, were done by this guy. Hold on, uh, Christopher Fama. Vince, do you know this name at all? I've, en- <laughs> I've encountered it before. Yes. What so, up, Fama? He's the guy that did the restorations <laughs> for this book. Uh, but where I first encountered him was he did the restorations for Young Romance Two. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. So Young Romance won. They just did scans of the, the comics, Fantagraphics did, and they republished it. And it was cool. But Young Romance 2 looks like a fucking brand new comic. Like, the paper's great. The colors are great. And uh, it's because this guy, the, on the very back page of Young Romance number 2, there's this about the restoration. And I pulled it out because I just want to give a quick rundown of what they do to these comics. This guy buys Golden Age comics. Presumably he buys them or he has them or, he, you know, some, some lunatic lends them to him for his collection. Uh, so they take the original page, they soak it in a solution, like in like a, a cooking tray, like a, like a tin, you know. And then they heat it to a near boil in a stove in this like liquid solution. And they pull it out with tongs, this page. Then now it's like this limp, you know, 100-year-old comic book page. 
and the color starts to just sort of fade off of it. Like it sort of comes off in the solution. Um, and so then they air dry it and flatten it. And then they scan it at high res and it sort of doesn't have any of the, the bend aid dots anymore. It doesn't have any of the color. And then he can scan it and bump the levels a little bit. And you get basically, you know, as close to line art as you could get on this stuff. But I just, I'm so fascinated about the idea of this guy chopping up comics. How did he figure it out? You know, how is he just like, all right, here's what I got to do. I got to put comics into a, a paint thinner solution and bake it until it boils. Uh, fascinating to me. And me so, too. Um, I'm just as uh, uh, excited that this guy worked on this comic as I am that Jack Kirby worked on it, I think. I'm just like, that's so cool. This guy's the coolest. And <laughs> and it's like hundreds of pages long, too. So I, I just imagine, you know, like, what is this guy's life like? Like, does he have several stoves running? You know, is it just... <laughs> <laughs> he's got one of those industrial kitchens, you know? Yeah, it looks like Breaking Bad, you know? Like, he's just... You know. <laughs> Driving around in an RV. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 16 hours making meth, the other eight hours doing comic restoration. <laughs> He's making the best of mainline comics. Uh, does he have a wife? Like, what's his family think about this? I don't, I'm, <laughs> Tony's I'm, writing his whole backstory. I want to. I want to. I am Stan Tom Scholey book about this guy that cooks these pages. <laughs> um, but yeah, this book is beautiful looking. Uh, uh, Eleven Klosters, if you're out there, uh, give it an order off of the uh, Tomorrow's site. Uh, it's it's really sharp, really beautiful. It contains uh, all the Kirby stuff um, from Charlton Bullseye, um, and or, or not Charlton Bullseye. Yeah, Charlton Bullseye. It w- went to Charlton after after Mainline. Like Mainline was the company, and they did like five issues, and then Charlton picked up the the comic Bullseye after them. But anyway, it's Kirby Western stuff. Uh, really sharp, really beautiful reproduction, and it's. Uh, Probably it's like larger than eight and a half by eleven. It's whatever like uh, I don't know what book to compare it to. Maybe like a Hellboy Library edition or like slightly smaller than that. It's nice. a big, very nice. And Simon's on inks, right? Uh, other people are too. Like it's a, it's definitely like a studio job. Hold on, let me look at this credits page here. Interesting. While well, you're finding that, Mike Royer's my favorite Kirby inker only because. Mike Mike Royer basically just blacked in Kirby's lines, right? I think it's the most Royer was the most faithful trans translation of Kirby's pencils, but right. there's something about Simon Ink and Kirby that I don't think you find anywhere else. It, Simon gave Kirby a more organic kind of uh, appearance where Jack could get a little blocky and a little grotesque i think there, and there's a lot of grotesque in simon's inks but i think um they complemented and enhanced jack's pencils unlike many uh, who have touched them so i'm yeah. always i'm always down for a simon kirby collab yeah it's, it's a lot of simon in here it's a lot of more meskin too oh nice uh, I, I agree with you that the simon stuff i feel like it's sort of uh it works better on stuff like this, I think, than on superhero stuff. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels gritty and, and, like, you know, feels like you're in a rocky desert when you're looking yeah. at it. We need more Western comics. Well, I got more Western comics now. I got a whole bunch more. Good for you. What was that, about 35 bucks? Uh, I think it was closer to 45 50, Dang. 40, 50 bucks. Nice. Yeah. Well worth it, too, I bet. Oh, sure. Yeah. Highly recommended. The fine works of Joe Simon, Jack Kirby, and of course, my hero whose name I can't remember. <laughs> the page dipper. I, I follow of- this woman on Instagram, and she's a document restorer. And more often than not, she'll put videos up of, of her restoring um, concert posters, vintage concert you know, posters, which admittedly were printed on a much heavier stock than comics but she does the same thing like she has this vat of stuff and she just puts the paper in it i'm like the fuck is going on mm-hmm. and she'll, she'll take it out and she'll hose it off with the you know a, 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 a sprinkle thing and then she puts it back and she's scrubbing it with a sponge and i'm like jesus but yeah. when it comes out it looks phenomenal like when she's done with it and she, she'll do the thing with the heating or the you know uh, like a like a hand dryer type thing not a hair dryer but some kind of drying mechanism and wow you would think like it was printed yesterday 
I don't know what's in that vat. I, it's probably like something from Lourdes or something, given the, these things eternal life. I don't know. But they, they, they look wonderful when she's done with them. So I, I wonder if this guy has videos up. He must. If he's Chris Hamill? Yeah. So. I'm going to search, gonna like search the, it up. I wonder if it's like movie blood, you know, like everybody has their own concoction that they like to use. When yeah. Because I know they just did, they had to do a similar thing for uh, Cyberforce to, like when they just did the Cyberforce omnibus, they had lost all the files for Cyberforce, so they had to like rescan and recolor it. Oh, is that right? Off, off of the comic books, yeah. Didn't but I don't think they went as far as like the, the solution dipping. I think it was probably just more Photoshopping and stuff yeah i have a lot more um i give situations like that a lot more leeway when the book was made in the 90s and you lost the files i can understand that but contemporary stuff like whenever you know you hear these horror stories about all oh, my files are gone like dude you're just not backing your shit up yeah you yeah. gotta back that shit up yeah like, back like backing that ass up you but i i get up. it when when hard drives back in the 90s were maxed out at like 200 megs you know what i mean yeah. 300 yeah. megs so, yeah, I, I understand. It's sad. But I'm glad that they, they rectified it because Cyberforce oh. is the bomb. You want to hear something funny? I don't know where all the Stray Dogs files are right now. Dude. Bro, uh, come on, dude. What? We have Wait, most what? Of Here's what happened. Uh, Image has a Dropbox. We have a, a local man Dropbox. Oh, my God. There was a Stray Dogs We're familiar. We, we, are, we have yeah, access cloud. to the Image Dropbox. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> Like we, so we maybe we have the files. Our files on our Dropbox. Maybe you guys could get a hold of these for me. We keep all our files on our Dropboxes, but then like print files, we move them over to the image Dropbox. And then just the other day, I was like, where'd that folder go? And I guess they just probably hopefully moved it to a different archive and didn't just delete it. Oh, my God. Mm. Why don't you make that a priority to find that out during for your real. Release? Two week hiatus between having to draw your next <laughs> issue. Yeah, tell them they have until you land in New York to find the files. That's right. <laughs> I lost a fa- I lost a job uh, I was working on somewhere in the '90s, and I vowed never ever because I had to do it over again. Obviously, I vowed never ever to let that happen again. So, whatever files I own are on Blu-ray disc. I have backups on like four or five hard drives, redundant backups. Like I, they're the same files are on more than one drive. Only because I I will never ever lose a file again. It's just not happening. Won't do it. Mm-hmm. I should be your arch- archivist. If yeah, if I, if it turns out I have lost these files, I'll fly you out here and have you set up a system for me. You be my archivist. Yes, you can be my, my I, I Chris would, class I, or whatever. I would love to do it. Yes. Yeah. Yep. All right, everybody. Hey. Thank you for being here with us one more time around. We uh, would love to thank our sponsor, which is... Tony, what's our sponsor? CheapGraphicNovels.com Yes, indeed. Remember, you are going to go to their site, CheapGraphicNovels.com. You're going to look around. You're going to say, oh, my goodness. I can save a lot of money here. You're going to order something, not too much. Don't order a whole bunch initially because I have a plan for you. Place an order, you're going to get an email confirmation saying, thank you for shopping at cheapgraphicnovels.com, intelligent person, where you saved a whole bunch of money. And you're going to reply to that email message saying, you know what? I would have never known about this glorious place if it wasn't for 11 o'clock comics. And Max is going to pat you on the head and give you uh, free shipping on your next order. And that's when you tank up. It's just common sense. Just do it. Also, if you would be so kind to please check out our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash 11 o'clock comics, audio downloads, video, um, vintage fanzines, page a day. You can get covers of Titanic team ups and other stuff. It's just a whole lot of fun. You can weigh in on the book of the month. You can also join our dedicated Slack channel where we convene each and every day to talk about everything some of it uncomfortable but that's life right Mm. so do that uh patreon.com forward slash 11 o'clock comics i don't know if you guys are aware of 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 this but i am completely uh enamored with the from software uh aesthetic i love it so much um elden ring uh 300 and 50 hours into it 
um, the uh, the Souls games are amazing. I love the look of these things. They're very hard, but um, the look is what drew me into it. And the thing that drew me into it first was Bloodborne. Yes, Bloodborne. So anytime I can get more of that from software goodness, I will leap into it. And uh, Titan Comics uh, publishes a Bloodborne uh, comic, and it's been going on for some time. Uh, interconnected miniseries, right? It was started off with uh, Alesh Coat was at the helm writing. It has since been handed over to the ever capable hands of Cullen Bunn. But all of the miniseries have been illustrated by Peter Peter, Co Peter Kowalski, my dude. Mm. Love him so much. Who's Cullen on color? Brad Simpson. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Um, the, la the, the previous miniseries was Bloodborne, Lady of the Lanterns, and I talked about that on the show. This picks up right where that left off. Um, if you remember, there was a brother and sister waiting for their father to come home because the, uh, the uh, Yarnum is not in uh, a good state with the Ashen Blood uh, Plague all over the place so they're waiting for the father to come home and unfortunately vivian the the young lady uh was consumed by the scourge and put down by a hunter leaving her brother lucian alone in comes gretchen and abraham the hunters and they kind of take lucian under their wing and because he he he, he saw his his father die so now he wants to eliminate this scourge by becoming a hunter, and he's all gung ho. And they're like, "You are not ready, little man." Um, in this story uh, miniseries, Lucian goes missing, and it's up to Gretchen and Abraham to retrieve him. Unfortunately, they don't know where he is, and they stumble upon a ritual that had yet to be completed. So what they do is they complete the ritual, and they are taken away and that's where this issue begins with a lot of creature carnage in the uh from software vein and i just think it's amazing uh but when peter kowalski illustrates something it has that extra little oomph that i love so much i will read anything that peter kowalski touches i do have quite a year yeah. He he must be extremely fast because this guy the same thing. Just knocking comics out. We've talked about right. four or five books from him this year. Now yeah. it's possible he was doing them for a few years and they all hit the Yeah, because they're all miniseries, so they're yeah, probably but still, or yes. staggered. But, still. but um if if you're uh, also uh, in addition to being a comic fan, if you're also a gamer and you are wise to the uh from software uh magic, you're gonna love Bloodborne. Uh they produce a slipcase. Well, you can get, I think it's the, fir the th first three miniseries all in one shot. And then you can buy the trades for the, the fourth. And I think this is the fifth, which has yet to be collected because this is the first issue. But it's great. Really awesome stuff. Bloodborne. Uh, Bleak Dominion, number one. Go get it from Titan. It's great. Notoriously difficult video games. Um, yes and no. Yeah, I think Dark Souls was the the pinnacle of difficulty. Like I couldn't just I could not do that fucking game. Any of them. I, I I have them. I've played them maybe for a couple hours, but they're just too hard. But I got all through Elden Ring. And that's Yeah, well, I mean, Elden Ring I as as we talked about before is supposed to, is by all accounts hard, but the reason I think Elden Ring was such a smash hit is it 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 seems like the reviewers said it it took the pedal off the gas a little bit relative to the Bloodborne games. Yeah. There, I mean, I've I've gone through boss battles in, in Elden Ring at least ten times just to get mm -hmm. through them. Yeah. It, it is hard, but it's not overwhelmingly so. Like yeah. Dark, Dark Souls. This is like... I've, I've fuck you the controller so many times mm -hmm. on that game. Yeah. yeah. No doubt. So there you go. Bloodborne. Great stuff. That's great. Womp, there it is. Uh, in your travels, this this isn't all that new, um, but I am in the process of just pulling things out. Random books. Actually, we were talking about this on the Slack because um, Vander's been looking for things to read. and uh, So one of the books that I pulled out from one of the stacks near me um, 
that's just been sitting here for a minute, is adapted from a novel by Michel Lebusi. It's uh, adapted by Fred Duvall, illustrated, beautifully illustrated by uh, Dieter Cassegrain, and it is a book by Magnetic called Blackwater Lilies. It is gorgeous. Uh, I haven't finished it yet, so that, that's why it's my in your travels. I didn't talk about it during the show. Um, but I'll have it finished soon. Uh, I, I know, I believe it was Kickstarter or part of a bundle with Kickstarter, and I just, I waited. Um, and it, it was definitely worth the wait. Uh, it's it's a, uh, it's it's a beautiful piece of work. I um, never read the novel, which, which is only a few years old. When did it come out? 2000 something but it is a uh it's yeah it's it's a stunningly gorgeous book magnetic puts out great books as we all know the little rounded corners um the hardcover is illustrated no dust jacket has a nice feel to it and um a really nice size so this way you can see um cast green's artwork um i definitely recommend it in your travels blackwater lilies from magnetic and if you want to hear a deep dive on it you can go to episode 647 there we go january 10th 2020 when mm. uh when i i talked about it when it was through europe comics mm -hmm. rest in peace europe comics but uh when they were giving us all that glorious european stuff on the digi yeah side. i don't even know if they're doing it on digi anymore but yeah no yeah. i think they're done i think they're kaput sadly but uh, they, they were great while they were around for show yep. 100%. Uh, um, yeah, my inner travels is going to be a book that I I mentioned already with the uh, in the thank yous up front, and that is uh, Rosemary Rosemary Valero O'Connell's "Don't Go Without Me." Um, I loved her. Uh, I think it was her second graphic novel called "Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up with Me." I believe it won the Ignats that year in 2019 for uh, best graphic novel. And pro I probably talked about it either late 2019 or early 2020 because I read it when it came out. But um, for some reason, I don't know why, maybe because it was pandemic, I don't know. But this follow-on, which came out a year later in 2020, I didn't even – I don't remember even noticing the solicits. So shame on me. But as I said, Davin was kind enough to send this to me, and uh, I read it as soon as I received it. And it's an absolute – it's a it's a it's a work of art it it is um it's a triptych well she describes it as a triptych it's basically an anthology but written and drawn by her completely and the narrative is a uh, a couple uh well the, the 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 i would say the overarching commonality between the three stories is is love and loss and and each story it's kind of got like a black mirror vibe and then each story is a different setting like the first one is a fantasy realm where two lovers shift into an alternate reality that's kind of like ours but they get lost from each other and then in their quest to find each other again they keep telling stories about each other but what they don't realize is that that's what this world consumes as its energy so as they share these stories in exchange for hints to where they're they are to find each other they're losing these memories so which is a pretty pretty crazy and cool idea if you think about it um and then uh the second story is uh, got more of a sci-fi bent where basically uh people's um uh emotions are powering um uh, are like the energy source these days for cpus um like they're basically plugged into people's brains and emotions power it and you can imagine how that might go horribly wrong and it does and then um, the third story is really probably my favorite. It's this beautiful narrative about uh, living and loving your life and your friends and your family and your lovers. And um, and it's it's in the backdrop of a gigantic creature is rising from the ocean and is going to destroy the earth. And they all know it, and they're kind of hoping that it's not going to happen. But but presuming that they got their dates right. The, this is the day and so it's a little journey through this woman and her her loved one's lives and they're just trying to live the, live the day to its fullest because you know an act of god or force of nature like this isn't really stoppable and uh like i said three stories that, that don't on the surface have a ton uh in common with each other but it's really about love and loss and they're all of course illustrated by uh by uh valera o'connell uh, and I love the, I'm a sucker for these 
mold like single tone books and that's what this is there's two or three colors per story uh, for the most part uh there's like some kind of pink overtone to each but then there's another a complementary color so like in one there's lavenders and one there's grays and one there's blues but 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 it's it's i just love that that effect uh I, that seems to always be a turn on for me when i come across uh, a comic work that that plays in just a few a few specific colors and uh, yeah, thanks so much, Davin, for for reminding me of this and, and sending it to me because I I definitely wish I had I should I should have read it when it came out. So um, don't go without me. Definitely gonna give that a look. I didn't know it came out either. The pages are beautiful looking. Yeah, man. Uh, in your travels, I just read issues three and four of this. Another sort of European classic, uh, Deadpool: Batter Blood. <laughs> you're fucked up <laughs> <laughs> jason have you read these no no oh man the, rob is just having a laugh boy he is out here having fun uh i i ran into him i do not know rob liefeld i we joke that i do know everybody but i don't know rob liefeld but we you know he, we, i know him well enough to to talk to him a little bit and tell him i love him uh and i told him how much i liked the first two of these at comic-con and he was like dude Issue three is one of my favorite things I've ever done. Uh, and he's obviously always sort of like amped up anyway. So I, I took it with a grain of salt. But this thing is super fun. For, as far as like new life health goes, it's a, a real treat. And the, the premise of this thing is, you know, who cares? Uh, Deadpool <laughs> fighting people uh, th- through, the, through a series of around 20 pages. There's a lot of double page spreads. There's some splash pages. In this one... He's fighting uh, dead venom pool a lot of the time, and and the 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 conceit is that they're trapped in like this sort of like VR AI uh, arcade type world where they're where they're being put through the paces for we don't quite know why yet, uh, but it's not arcade. It's this girl arcade named Arcata, which I think Arcady is a better name, but whatever. Uh, this thing's super fun, and and like I said, it's just a lot of big, big artwork, you know. Um, there's there's a two-page spread in the middle, like on the staples, that is like the meanest, cleanest Rob Liefeld art I've seen in forever, of just Deadpool punching the crap out of this Venom Deadpool. Um, just It's so clean that it almost looks like Ed McGinnis, you know? Like, it's just, it's dope looking. Um, colors are by uh, J.D. Ramos. Um and, he, and I feel like a lot of, you know, when you take on a Liefeld book now, the colorist job is to sort of embellish a lot and sort of throw in some background nonsense here and there. Because Rob's, for the most part, just drawing the figures and make, trying to make them look as cool as possible. Um, but this one, like I said, he's fighting this Venom pool. And then he ends up in the Savage Land and we get some Zabu. We say Zabu or Zabu? What do you guys say? Zabu. Say Zabu. Zabu. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything here, but the Imperial Guard shows up. Uh, the Shi'ar Imperial Guard, not not any other Imperial Guards. Uh, <laughs> Deadpool Corps shows up. Fucking uh, Deadpool gets a lightsaber at a certain point. They don't Shikla, <laughs> is, Shikla, is Shikla in it? Uh, ooh, wait, what? Shikla, his wife, the vampire. The vampire. Oh, Lady Deadpool? No, no, no. Okay, no, she's not, they're not in. It. Here's who is the Deadpool Corps that's in there. There's like the cosmic Deadpool. There's the little boy, the dog, the head, mm-hmm. the floating head guy, and the sure. Okay. That's who showed up so far. But yeah, it's just it's an opportunity for Rob Liefeld to just get to draw whoever he wants. Um, and issue four, more way more cable in that one, which you know. Ooh. For Vince, sure. For me, <laughs> Vince's I ears are perked up. Um, the Spider Man's in it too. It's just it's super fun. It's all kinds of crazy shit going on in this, and I guess issue five is the last one. So uh, if you haven't been reading it, the trade should be along sooner than later. Um, and it's great. It's fun. Recommended. I like his what, – what issue you say this was? Four? Four. I like his cover for this. It's really well done. With the, with the Venom pool on the yeah, cover? Yeah. Yeah. The, co- the cover for three that's just a close-up of Venom pool's head is also fucking real gnarly. The colorist went crazy on it. Yeah, I'm gonna read this. Um, I was just gonna hang back and wait till it was done and collected because they usually mm. they usually give Rob the the oversized format, don't they? Wait, they, waiting for the trade. Yeah, well, yeah, 
Yeah. Well, that first one came out as a hardcover first, like a regular size hardcover. Okay. All right. Yeah, I knew there was uh, a hardcover somewhere in this equation. And then they they split it up and put it out as issues, and that's why they did the sequel series because that sold super well in just issues. This thing that had already been out um, in hardcover form. It sounds right up my alley, man. If I mean, if yeah, you got the the zombie Deadpool head in there, like I'm in. Yeah, this one's a lot more like the first one was like Rob sort of building new lore and and like he introduced this character Thumper. I was gonna say yeah, yeah, I read that, yeah. He ties into Deadpool's history and you know, like he's he's definitely building Deadpool lore. And this one's more just like, what if we just went ape shit with the you know, mm-hmm. crazy stuff? Is this written by that same duet he always says to his books? Uh, yeah, it's just the one of it's Chad Bowers. Oh, what happened to the other? The, the War Rocket Ajax or whatever those dudes. Yeah, yeah. Well, the one is the one was War Rocket Ajax. Yeah, yeah I don't know what happened to the other guy, but to mm. hear, I mean, and he does a pretty good job of putting you know Patty. Or, or like witty patter for Deadpool because I think you need that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I don't think anyone's telling Rob what to draw. I think they just come in afterwards. Yeah, yeah. On. Speaking of witty banter, uh, do we have a book of the month for this month? Or no, we'll discuss it. Okay, oh. all right. Stay uh, tuned, everyone, because book of the yeah, month is next we'll, is next uh, week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll definitely. It, uh, it's next week. Yeah, next week's the twenty seventh. Yeah, twenty seventh. Yeah. Wow! Snuck up on you. Remember when we did Mouse? That was a good one. Was Dude, great. it's funny you bring that. I just I just sent my copy of Mouse along with one of my copies of Watchmen down to or up to Boston University because my son is studying them both in his uh, elective that he's taking on comics this semester. Oh, nice! I, I feel like I saw Facebook pictures of your son's dorm room. He had some comics on the shelf. I like that. Yes, sir. Yep. Chip off the old block. Yes, that's right. Yeah, really excited for him to read Watchmen and Mouse, man. Can't get much better than that. You cannot. Unless he doesn't like them, then it's not a good thing. Well, I told him, I said, listen, I said, if you're if 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 you if if these are a slog for you, I'm like, you're gonna have to lie to me. <laughs> Just shut up about it. Yep. They come around though eventually, which is good. Yeah. Time and experience, right? Damn skippy bippy. Yeah, Tony, that's what I was talking about. The 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 venom or face the whole face on the cover yeah. was the one i thought the, this cover's nice but the the last cover was really well done yeah the Good. colorist on, the, on that cover of issue three was going cra- like heavy metal crazy nothing wrong with that yeah all right people hey thank you for being here with us one more time uh we hope you come back one next more week time. because we'll have more of this M- maybe tony but probably not but maybe we'll see. Unless we, <laughs> what if we pick a book of the month that you're just like, dudes, I gotta talk about that with you. <laughs> you never know. I, we'll come rushing back. Yeah. For that discussion. You know, I love a book of a BOTM discussion. Mm. Yep. One topic. Started from work. the bottom. Now we're here. That's right. <laughs> so, do yourself a favor. Get your uh, took us to a comic shop. Buy some comics. Read them. Talk about them online. Come back here. Maybe we'll be talking about them. And maybe you can even join in on the discussion on the Slack thing. Or on the Facebooks or wherever the social medias carry us because we're all over the place. So uh, say good night. <laughs> Tugboat David. Yep. Good night. Yep. Yep. Easy one. Yep. Yeah, I was throwing audio at him, but. Jason, three, was, three weeks from now, we will be together. How about York? that? Well, in Jersey. In Jersey. We'll be together yeah. in Jersey. Jersey. What? Uh, so are you still on your art, high, high artists for New York Comic Con? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Jesus sort of. What's, what's yeah. it, what, what are your boundaries? Uh, I'm going to bring my jam pieces. Okay, so no solo shots, just jam pieces. And one solo shot. What are you getting? Well, I don't have anything from Valerio Skeety, and he's oh. coming, and he's going to be at, t- at Cadence's table, and he doesn't come to the U.S. very often, so I procured a domino from him. But Fair enough. That's yeah. very reasonable. Yeah, I, I ran it by the wife. She was cool with it. Yeah, She was proud of my of my restraint this year. She she doubted I was going to actually show restraint. So. Don't doubt you, sir. I'm a man of principle, you know. Nah, if that, I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do yeah, it. Yeah, that's one thing about Jason. If he says he ain't moving, he's not moving. Yeah. Oh, man. 
So, but yeah, we'll see. But I'm, 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 I'm not. There's no. It's a weird thing because because like especially on our Slack, we have a very vibrant art channel, and normally I'd be right in the thick of like the hustle of like oh there this this person's opened up the list, you know this this reps opened up the list, and and it's it's happening because there's so many art collectors on our Slack channel. But I'm just like nah, man. I'm just I'm rolling up in there, just free as a bird. If 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 something's available and it strikes me cool, if not, now nah, we're good. That's gonna be fun, I think. I think like uh, we'll see. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I have some agenda about it, but we'll see. I think you'll miss it, but like from having done the way I do Comic Con now is sort of like that, where I have very little going on. I just sign, set up a few things, and then I can sort of just wander around, have a nice time. I think you're gonna enjoy hanging out with the boys that way. I mean, you you get tired of digging in them bins. No bin, di- no bin digging for me, but um, but yeah, no, we're all fun, dude. Like, we always have fun, and we haven't seen each other in a year. Yeah, and. Uh, and we're going to get some good eats, and we're going to hang out with some folks. So, yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah, sounds cool. Yep. And I think the weather will be pretty cool, so we won't have to be sweating our balls off, which is nice. Mm. It will be even more fun if Tony decides to go. Just I feel saying. like next year is my big return. I've got a your triumphant month. return this year. Yeah, no, no, no fleece, no, no Scotty Young this year. No, it's mm-hmm. uh, no Tana Ford, right? No, ta- I don't. I don't remember seeing her on the list. No. What the hell? What a delight. Super, super <laughs> that long. Now, had you guys spent much time together before? Never. I never met no. her before. I only know her from when she comes on this show. And, and It's so guys- funny because you've been at probably 100 cons together. Yeah, for sure. Nice. Yeah. Well, I love I love when we bring good people together. I went up and I made a point to go say hi. When I showed up, she she knew exactly what was going on. She's love like, it. Is the other fourth chair. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, the lady does not suffer fools as well. So she was not. I will say, for as much as Vince adores you and Tana, and would love to have either of you be our permanent fourth chair or fifth chair, fourth and fifth, uh, it is rare in the fifteen years we've known the show that I've seen him fanboy out like he was with Josh. That, yeah, that was wild. You I were was, so excited, man! It was nice to see. He, he really was uh, affected by that book. I, I love. I love him very much. Yeah. I, I hope he can get you that slipcase. I, I was. Like, I already oh, ordered it. I oh, yeah, we all ordered it. it. Yeah. I think all three yeah. of us ordered it while we were doing the show. Yeah. Yep. So you already had the book. You just had to order the slipcase part. No, I he, don't have the book. I I didn't. I hadn't ordered the book. Um, same. So yeah. So I, I I jumped on it. Yeah. He he threw the PDFs at us, and he's like, uh, Yeah, you know, yeah. He has sent us the PDF. But I had ordered it from uh, DCPS, so now I have a slipcase copy and a regular copy, whenever they decide to come. So uh, maybe I'll turn it around, give it to a listener or something. We'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really bless somebody on the Patreon, the patrons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Better act somebody. Yeah. Tell them you love them. Love I really them. do love them. I'm feeling the love again. We're like we're cresting into the into the it's the fall. The weather's changing. I got my sweater on. It's life is good. It's uh, comics are good again. Best time of year. Yeah, it's beautiful. Come I up. dude, I, I I my wife's got the bum ankle, so I'm like, you know, I'm gonna cook dinner tonight. I whipped up on the fly. We had some little Trader Joe's pumpkin gluten-free ravioli. I, I, I whipped up a little dab of proud of the little first time ever. I whipped up a little sage brown butter walnut uh, joint. Ooh. Just right, right on the fly, dude. Literally like I'm like, oh, we, we got these ingredients. Let me see how this works. And it worked out beautifully. Feel, I'm feeling I'm feeling it. Life is good right now. We're cycling into a good time. Love it. That's it for that one.